Good evening and welcome to the April 22nd work session of Richmond Community Schools Board of School Trustees. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we are ready for the reading of our mission statement, please. Richmond Community Schools guides students on pathways of learning to a future of limitless possibilities. Thank you, Kelly. And now, would you please read our vision statement? Richmond Community Schools, a community nurturing mind, body, and spirit to prepare students for lives of choice, purpose, and service. Thank you, Kelly. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Poindexter. Okay, we're ready for our celebration of the joy of learning, and I believe we'll uh, go first with the recognition of our high school students, Richmond High School students. Perhaps Ray, you're, are you available? Maybe our the showcase video. video. Okay, the showcase video. Do we have a showcase? No. No, it's, no. it's, it's the art. It's the art part. But that we're gonna do we're gonna do that second, I think. No, you. You're first. You're first, Ray. Ray, you come ahead. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I just recognize just got back. Thank you very much. It is such a great honor to always be in front of the uh, school board and cabinet members and superintendent uh, to have you help celebrate all the great things that are happening at Richmond High School. And so my part tonight, I have four seniors that have some outstanding uh, academic accomplishments and have been rewarded for those accomplishments. Um, I'm going to go through uh, their accomplishment and then I uh, invite you to ask them questions, maybe how they were selected um, or anything else that you would be interested in. Uh, Dustin Swander. Dustin Swander is a finalist in the National Merit Scholarship Program. This is our third National Merit Scholarship finalist in the past four years at Richmond High School. There are 1.4 million students across the nation and approximately 15,000 are chosen as finalists. And from those 15 finalists, of which Dustin is currently uh, one of the finalists, the selection of approximately 8,000 merit scholarship winners from across the country is now in progress and will be announced in May. So we wanna wish Dustin the best of luck, all right? Okay, I'm gonna talk about Caitlin. Uh, I'm gonna let them ask some questions. Okay. I them. <laughs> all right, Caitlin, come on up, Caitlin. So they have a face with the name. Caitlin Doyle. The Cox Research Scholars Program is one of the most prestigious and competitive scholarships at Indiana University and is a merit-based scholarship program open to Indiana residents of exemplary achievement and scholarly curiosity. The Cox Research Scholars Programs offers the recipients the unique opportunity to participate in meaningful research under the mentorship of a faculty member at IU. The Cox Research Scholarship covers four years of full wow, tuition. Awesome. All right, Caitlin, congratulations. All right, let's have Julia, uh, Julia Keene. Julia has been selected for admission to the Indiana University Kelly School of Business Scholars Program. The Kelly Scholars Program is one of the country's premier undergraduate business scholarships. 
The award is given to only 10 outstanding incoming freshman students who are Indiana residents providing four years of full tuition and fees, a stipend for living expenses, and a study abroad opportunity. All right. And then we have Chrissy Kramer. Chrissy was chosen as a Lilly Scholarship winner. The Lilly Scholarship was be, uh, begun in 1998 and it offers a four year full tuition academic scholarship to Indiana students who intend to work towards a baccalaureate degree at any accredited or public, public or private college or university in Indiana. And where have you chosen to go, Chrissy? Uh, Indiana University. Indiana University. <laughs> no influence that their principal is an Indiana University <laughs> alumni, but um, this scholarship, besides providing uh, full tuition, uh, the scholarship also provides $900 per year for required books and equipment. Nice. Chrissy Kramer. So I'm going to have all four of these uh, <clears throat> students come forward. And if, any questions that you would like to ask them, please do so at this time. Thank you. Kelly. Um, Caitlin, do you know what you're going to study? Um, well, I proposed that I would be studying um, the bioaccumulation of microplastics in Indians. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about um, studying how plastic affects birds when they ingest it. Um, You're amazing. That's just amazing. <laughs> um, it's a really big problem in marine ecosystems, but I want to mm -hmm. see how it differs between the two places. Cool. And um, Dustin, I think you're the only one I didn't hear where you were going to go to school. I'm going to attend the University of Chicago studying economics and sociology. Great. Goodness. Well, I, I, I think that we should also congratulate the parents. I don't know if all the parents are out in the audience or not. Yes, but. I, I think I'd, I'd like for, as a parent, please to stand, all right, so we can recognize mm -hmm. you. I can't think of any way that a parent could be any prouder than probably they are right now. Absolutely. Congratulations. Chrissy? Uh, I think Lily requires an essay or a, th a thesis of some sort, do they not? What was the subject this year that, that you were required to write on? Um, you were supposed to talk about your challenges. Okay. And I wrote about uh, how I moved around a lot when I was younger and how that's formed me to be who I am. Well, and I, I think as well as the parents, it has made Richmond Community I'm Schools sorry. proud. I mean, to have people up here year after year that have won these kinds of scholarships is, it, it says a lot about Richmond Schools, I think. So, and best, best of luck to all of you in your careers. Congratulations. And I will have to say that um, as a teacher <laughs> of one of the students standing there, it certainly makes me very <coughs> proud. And um, I had Caitlin, as a matter of fact, I had Caitlin two years. And uh, that's exactly what we studied. In <laughs> <laughs> Did you repeat it? <laughs> Which, what she said right there, that was it. I wouldn't want to take her thunder. <laughs> so uh, I, I understand why she's doing what she's doing and going into what she's going into. And but anyway, all of you, we are so proud. Susie. And Suzanne. Uh, Julie, I was going to ask you, Kelly, that's a, that's a big deal. What is it that you'd like to do when you finish? Um, I'm not completely sure what I want to do after Kelly. Right now, my intended major is economic consulting. So hopefully something in Chicago or New York City working with um, one of the larger firms and just trying to figure out their economic policy. Nice. Well, thank you. We are, we are proud. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations and best of luck. Ms. Wolpe, I think you must have others. Yes, we do. I'm going to bring um, uh, Rusty Hensley. 
our career director at Richmond High School, and we have more students uh, that we're going to recognize tonight. So, Rusty, I'll thank you. Over. It's always a pleasure to come this time of year. As Mrs. Morgan has said, it gets a little busy this time of year. I've been on the phone with our different celebrations coming up, but it's been an exciting month for us. We have three academic teams in the Career Center. Uh, we had all three academic teams had state qualifiers this year, but tonight we bring some of the national qualifiers forward. In our hands-on trades area our, and in Skills USA, uh, we had state champions in firefighting this year. If Greg and Dylan will come up, and, and we also had state champions in our robotics area this year uh, with Mr. Knapp. Two of those students who are going on the nationals in Louisville for the robotics are in a different competition this week and are out of town. So, Mr. Knapp. Mr. Nash on his own. His students aren't, aren't here. But in our partnership, real quick, in our partnership, this is our first year for fire and rescue. And in our partnership this year, we our first year we went out, and Greg Moore here is our instructor there, and, and we were proud to have a state champion. Not only was he proud that he had a student, but also his son was the state champion. Oh, so, wow. so wow. A proud, a proud father day as well as a proud instructor day. So I will turn it over to these guys at this point. Greg, go ahead. Uh, uh, Rusty didn't tell me I was going to have to talk, but um, the, the program itself um, has been pretty rewarding this first year, getting it started. Uh, we're seeing some things we want to make some adjustments to, but uh, all in all, it, it kind of fit where we thought it would. Um, moving along, uh, the kids are at their certification phases right now. We're going through some state certification stuff, um, getting them finished up for their, their uh, dual credit. So as far as the, the competition goes, we took four individuals because we didn't have a regional competition. So four of our individuals got to go to the state. Um, we ended up finishing uh, first, fifth, seventh, and tenth out of 18. Nice. So for our first year in the program, our first year going to Skills USA, yeah, we were very, fantastic. very pleased with where we finished. So, and one of our students just had made one little mistake on a knot. Otherwise, I think we would have had um, everybody in the top seven. So um, it, was, it was a unique competition. Um, eye-opening for me the first year seeing it so uh, we're looking forward to going back next year thank you thanks great thank you thank you uh, I'll tell about my kids but also on on their program uh, he said they're doing state certifications they were just doing that today yeah. <laughs> and if you follow mr. Hensley on Twitter he's tweeted some pictures of what they're doing and they're literally in their Turnout, their turnout gear. <laughs> what you, we haven't run the Lego yet. <laughs> the firefighter <laughs> gear. They're, they're in their gear and they're on a hose and there is a propane tank yes. raging in fire and there's kids actually putting it's It's awesome. So, uh, But that's a really cool program. My program was the model robotics and uh, my students uh, that competed in it are actually in St. Louis at a different robotics uh, the nationals or worlds competition uh, the program they're with is a, is a club program outside of mm -hmm. uh, Richmond Community mm -hmm. Schools but for this one it's pretty much the same thing they're given a problem um, and they have they're given it it's literally a kit they get a box and they open up the box and they build the robot to fix the problem so they have to pick up a cube and move it to another side to score points so this year uh, we're going to nationals for uh, that mobile robotics same student Jordan Haney went to nationals last year for drafting so and then uh, Blake Dunham is his partner there they're the ones going so Great. Ron that 20-foot flame was perfectly safe any questions for for group one yes because yeah. I know they'll be one. <laughs> come on up to the mic <laughs> yeah. I, I just I'm excited I know you have a legacy that you're following, but tell me a little bit about what goes on on a daily basis in your in your program. Uh, the program, uh, I actually commute from Hagerstown to here and then here to my home school, which is in Modoc, Indiana. Um, a day in a program where we're at the training ground is we basically show up, we get our gear, <coughs> our gear is on, we're ready to go. Uh, we do different types of scenarios, whether it be search and rescue or fire attack. Um, it's just day-to-day -day stuff that the normal guys would do. We're just preparing for the future and uh, we're <coughs> basically doing worst case scenarios so that we're prepared for anything that happens. He'll throw stuff at us that you would think would never happen and until it does. Until it does. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, whether it be flames from multiple stories or going through a box that is 16 inches. Very good. So, great explanation. Thank you. Yeah. So you've had the opportunity to grow up with your father being uh, a role yes. model for you. And I'm proud to say that I've worked with him for a number of years. But in this time that you've gone through this, how has your understanding of the dangers that he faces every day, um, how has your understanding changed? When, when you're actually faced today, actually being a part of it, when you're actually faced with the heat and the flames and the danger is there, but we were put in a shipping container today and it's completely safe. It's, they do it all around the country. It's a shipping container, they light a fire, and it's what they call a flashover scenario. Which, in a flashover scenario, they is a burn barrel, and the fire is coming over the top of you. And it's what they call rollover. And when fire rolls over, it's the heat ex or expanding over the ceiling level. And the dangers you face are, I don't want to say imagination, but they're not, it's more... It's more mental than it's physical danger. If you put yourself in a dangerous situation and you panic, that's when it becomes a hazard to you and to other people in your group. Uh, firefighters are meant to work as a team. And you, you work as a team because if one person struggles with something and the other person is good at it and you're in a team, you have that capability of being able to do that task without struggling or without putting yourself or the others in danger. Cool. Good answer. Yes. Absolutely. Sounds Very like good. you have. Um, Guess we know why you're a state champion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So, I you think doing you okay have. back there, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> He's making me want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I never met him before. <laughs> I, I think you've proven yourself right here tonight, and um, Thank you. we're very proud of you. And um, continue learning and growing, and we will look forward to you being a. Uh, Firefighter, one of these days. Thank you. Congratulations. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> can I please leave? <laughs> you did great. I'm sure, you no. could answer them. That we know. That. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And we wish Sam the best of luck. They'll head to Louisville the third week in uh, June for their national competition. And also in the partnership right now, our construction program is building a training some of the training facilities that they went through today at their training site here in town. So it's not only a partnership with <coughs> the Richmond Career Center and the fire department, it's also a fire department and our construction. So it, it's been a great year for us. So good luck and we thank, thank all three of you. Russ, thank you. Thank you. Our next group that's Wait, coming up. One second, what was the, there were, were there two kids? Who's all going to nationals for Jordan. fire? Oh, for fire, just Dylan. Just Dylan. Just Dylan. Okay. Dylan. Dylan. In, in the Skills USA competition, you have to be the state champion. They, gotcha. They are, there's no placing. You have to be number one. Gotcha. So and then with the robotics, it's Jordan Haney and Blake Dunham? Yes. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So, like like uh, Mr. Knapp said, they're already at competition right now. That's we, great. They left yeah. this morning. I so, saw that about them. That's uh, pretty neat. Yeah, they're, they are excited. Trust me, they're excited. <laughs> our next group, uh, been here many years in a row, but our Business Professionals of America, BPA, uh, this year, 14 of our students have qualified for nationals. They get to go a little bit further than Louisville. They're heading off to California here in a few weeks. So I will turn it over to one of their advisors, Ms. Sell. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, thanks for having us here again this year. Uh, we'd like to share another success story for our BPA students this year. We took 24 to state, 24 students, and qualified 14. This is the largest group that we're getting to experience taking across the country here uh, beginning on May 6th we leave and then we will return on May 10th. Um, so I'm going to let them come up and introduce themselves. We have four represented. Two of um, the students that did qualify are also at the Rural's no Robotics. We've got two students there that will be going to nationals with the group and then we've got other students that are participating in athletics and some other events they have going on. So there were four that were able to attend here this evening. So I'll let them introduce themselves, tell them what they're doing to prepare for nationals and what they're going to be competing in. Hi, I'm Aaron Bischoff, and I'm going to nationals for computer modeling and for fair trade. I'm Maya Van Buskirk, and I'm going to nationals this year as the fair trade team captain. 
Uh, my name is Julianne Chin. I am part of the fair trade team, and I also placed first at state in medical <coughs> procedures. Okay. Hello, my name is John Holthouse, and I'm also part of the fair trade team. We, uh, again, this year branched off into some new competitions, and computer modeling was one of them. So if you have questions about that, be sure to ask him what all that involves. And then also, we uh, qualified a global marketing team this year. It's the first time we've taken that team to nationals. So that's exciting. We also um, have a couple students in different computer events, computer programming, computer security. We've had <coughs> some other students in computer PC servicing as well. So we're trying to, again, tackle some, some new areas, which is an, uh, new for our department and our school, and we're having some success in those areas. We also have students in competitions that they've done before, like entrepreneurship. We're still very strong in some of our business and technology events as well. So if you have any questions for... Well, come up and tell us about computer modeling. <clears throat> okay, so um, the way computer modeling <laughs> works is that they give me a prompt, and I basically just have to make a 3D model using a computer program of my choice to fulfill that prompt. So this year I was told to make a new mascot for a baseball team. So I got seven to eight weeks to come up with a character concept for a new baseball team and then to create that character in a 3D modeling program on the computer. So what was your character? Say, what was the team? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually made the snowman. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> Frozen? No. <laughs> Very good. So tell us about fair. What fair trade? So fair trade our national is, champion was in fair trade. Yes. Yeah. The first year we did was 2013. We were best overall in fair trade in the yes. expo, and then last year we were best in fair trade practices. So fair trade is kind of the integration of both business principles and kind of humanitarian principles mm -hmm. because we both have we have to create a business plan, but so for a successful business, but that business has to in some way, shape, or form help a third world country, and so we've been working on this since before we went to state because we've had our team decided we have eight members on the team total. I'm the captain, and then different members have different responsibilities. But really, the only thing that makes the captain different is I present to the judges at the competition. So, because only the captain can talk to the judge, but everyone will contribute, everyone will present at the table, and everyone will kind of help pitch in and get it all worked together. So this year, our business plan is, well, our company is called Piece It Together, and we are a puzzle company. Yes. And our third world contribution is we have um, citizens in Kenya make these 3D wooden uh, mine teasers out of well, wood from Kenya, so it not only helps we provide wages and places <coughs> for them to work and et cetera, stuff like that. But also the wood can be recycled and we can like cut it into wood chips and then put it back into the environment. Because we want to try and get as much environmentally friendly and just general good giving back as much as we do um, make profit, which will in turn also go back to them because we're a nonprofit organization. And so we had, we had some students to work together on the business plan and we worked on promoting and we're working on getting our products. And when we get out there, we're gonna spend the first couple days promoting. Cause we have this, we're coming with, with all these different ideas to get people to come to our booth. Cause when we first came up with this idea, we thought puzzles would be a great way to get people into it. Because when you see a puzzle just walking along and you see a puzzle, you wanna try it. You wanna see how, well, how good you can do it. And one of the best things I think we have planned for this year <coughs> is we're doing a time trial where we'll have this puzzle set up and we'll have a leaderboard so that everyone can try and piece and put it together and the best time at the end of the expo will win a prize. So that's something that I think is just one facet of the business that I think we're all pretty proud of and we're glad we came up with it. And I don't think we'd change it if we could. <laughs> so I'm gonna let John talk about the business plan because he wrote a majority of it. Okay, so our business plan is basically the makeup of our business mixed in with data from uh, the mix of our <coughs> economies and Kenya's economies and then we applied fair trade principles with them in order to promote for economic welfare in Kenya. Wow. 
So, so is that awesome. a Rose Holman? Is that your college that you're going yeah. to? Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, awesome. While he's up there, when he said that, <laughs> the day that I read on Twitter that Dustin was accepted to the University of Chicago, I also read on Twitter this young man got a $100,000 scholarship Woo! Rose Holman. So, yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you couldn't have picked a better college in the state of Indiana. <laughs> Okay, we got a Juliana, do you want to talk about uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matt Dirk? What was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. medical office procedures. <laughs> so at the state level, I participated in medical office procedures. Um, basically, it's a written test. There's some a multiple choice portion, and then actually application of medical office procedures. So you can uh, transcribe things, dictate, um, and you know take memos. Um, so I placed first uh, because I just did some mass memorization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, it was fun overall. Um, I'm excited to go to nationals and represent Richmond uh, as well as participate in fair trade. So, yeah. Thank you. So what part of California? Anaheim. Mm, uh -huh. Look at you guys. They had to go to Disney. 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 Right. Yes. <laughs> now, did we ask you guys what, how, are you all seniors? Okay. Wow. <coughs> you do uh, four, four seniors. Okay. Four seniors do the rest of you have plans yet? Do you know what you want to do when you finish high school? Uh, <laughs> You're still working on it? That's part of, that's one thing I like about BPA is like it gives you the chance to explore Try some opportunities stuff. that you might not end up in. Because I competed in broadcast news. And I, I remember that. You guys did really well. The nationals last year. <coughs> Hopefully didn't do so well this year, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can always say we got eight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about this. No, but something I remember during one of our presentations, I mentioned that they asked us, "Is this what you want to do?" And I said, "Probably not." But that's what I love about BPA is it gave me the chance to explore that part of me that liked doing the news and liked all that stuff. And I think that's an all-around thing Absolutely. for BPA because odds are, it's kind of iffy whether we'll do this in our adult lives. So I like that we have this opportunity to explore that part of ourselves while we still can. That is a really, really good answer. <laughs> that is, no, that's fantastic. It's why kids need to try all the opportunities that are at the high school. That's it. You nailed it. Very good. Well, congratulations and good luck uh, at Nationals. We'll be cheering you on. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have, have any additional? <coughs> Jesus this is going Wolpe. on. Right. <coughs> right. Mrs. Wolpe, yeah. you want to uh, tell us about what happened today real quickly? She's got some other athletes, too, I think, or something. The athletes oh. couldn't come. So oh, I yeah. see. This is a replacement for the athletes. We just got this information later recently. We had approximately 375 ninth graders leave the building at 8.30 this morning after explicit instructions for the day from their English teachers, uh, Kate Hogg, uh, Meg Rayburn, and Michelle Holliday uh, have organized a service project every year for our ninth graders. Uh, the message that we want to send to them is that uh, part of life is serving others. And so that was the message for the service to the community today. And so 300, approximately 375 ninth graders, uh, 300 of them were at Cope Environmental Center. Um, I know Louise uh, Ronald uh, was out there today with them. The thing that struck me at, at about 7 o'clock this morning, I'm getting a frantic phone call from one of the English teachers going, oh, my gosh, it's raining. Oh, my gosh, it's 40 degrees. Do you think we still ought to do this? And then before I could answer, she said, yes, we still need to do this. So I'm just asking your – and I said, yes, we'll do it. And the kids were phenomenal. They were just phenomenal. And I could not be prouder. I know that you – could not be prouder of how our students represent themselves 
uh, in the community. And what they do is they spread the good word about Richmond High School. And we always tell them when they go out in the community, you are not only representing Richmond High School, but you're representing all of Richmond community schools. And people are going to judge what we are like on your behavior. And, and again, I, I have gotten nothing but uh, kudos uh, from all of the places that they went today. So uh, I'm very, very proud of our ninth grade English teachers for it was a tremendous task. If you can even imagine getting uh, 375 kids. Uh, Suzanne helped us with the buses. Uh, the uh, Maggie LaRue and her staff provided lunches. And so it was a collective effort of uh, lots of people within Richmond Community Schools. And it just shows what a great team, what a great family we are here in Richmond. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ray. Much. And um, tell the kids we are proud of them. I will and, do that. And uh, we certainly thank the <coughs> teachers thank for you. organizing. I, I, will, I will share that because I know that they will appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was an impressive view for sure. <laughs> <coughs> we do not really have a video, Mark, do we? We, we do have video, I believe. Or a video? Mm -hmm. or the, I, the arts? I thought we yes. did. Okay. We have Visu one, yes. Visual arts. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Griffin offers all of the two-dimensional, which are the painting and the drawing classes. She offers that at all different levels. And I teach all of the sculpture or 3D projects, or classes rather, uh, ceramics and jewelry. I had been an interior designer and I was volunteering at Charles School um, in my children, my own children's classes doing art projects. And it just led me to think that it would be a more direct outlet for my creative abilities. My favorite part of being a teacher is seeing the outcome of the kids' projects and the new ideas they come up with for designs. They gain confidence when they see that they can actually do things and they're successful at projects. But there is a lot of math and science and physics in art so that translates into their other subjects. We write in art, we do art criticism, so it helps with their verbal and writing skills. So all the elementaries have an art teacher. Both of the middle schools have an art teacher. Hibbert also has their own art teacher, and we have two in Richmond High School. Mrs. Hoffman is here this evening, so glad you're here. You want to? Hi, glad to be here. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I know that you used to be an elementary art teacher. I've and taught at all three levels in Richmond. So now you're at the high school. Yes. Yes. So, um, what are the challenges, and what are the um, successes? The successes are getting students that I had in elementary schools and middle schools and seeing that they actually do grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and their art, their art abilities do mature. Um, their ideas have grown, so that's rewarding to see. The challenges are the challenges of dealing with teenagers, you know. <laughs> Do you remember my daughter? I do remember your daughter. I remember your son also yeah. at Crestdale. <laughs> um, 
my daughter will be graduating in a few weeks from Roland College, and then she will be going to uh, Japan for two years to teach and to earn her master's degree. She was with me, and I made dinner for her last night because our time together is going to be very short over the next few years. And we sat and we talked about the influences that she had in her life, especially her teachers. And it's, I, it's not by coincidence you being here tonight because she said of her teachers that she remembered the most, you were one of them. Who really? Was the most influential. Yes. So I wanted to share that with you. <laughs> it's a shiver. <laughs> Well, and I just wanted to say I worked with you in your some of your classrooms when you were at Dennis, and it was a joy to watch how the kids worked and how you interacted with them. Thanks. Because uh, it's, it's a real plus for what you do. Thanks. It was a joy to be a teacher under you, too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Leah, you want to talk about the Wayne County Art Show that's currently going oh, on? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, it's a art show at the Richmond Art Museum. It's all the high schools in Wayne County. Um, I just had a conversation with um, Lance Crow, who is a director of education at the museum. And next year is gonna be the 10th anniversary of the show as he has it now. It used to be just Richmond High School. Um, even when my kids were in school, 13, 14 years ago. So now they've expanded it to all the high schools, which we really like. Um, I've even asked them if we can have a meeting with all the art teachers so we can, you know, pick their brains about their ideas. And I know some of them want our ideas. So next year, they're going to try to um, incorporate a little bit more through a grant to all the art departments and um, he's going to come and talk to all the students at the beginning of the year to promote the idea that we want you to do the quality of work in your art that you would be really proud of thus more uh, promoting the idea of their art getting into an art show that art show is currently going right now it ends at the end of this week okay. there are three huge rooms full of art from all the high schools two long hallways with showcases there's sculpture jewelry ceramics paintings drawings all kinds of interesting things <coughs> really interesting it's a good show mm -hmm. Well, Leah, thank you for all that you Thanks do. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It is appreciated. You are appreciated, and um, it looks as if our students are um, getting to explore lots and lots with art. Yes, they love it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have additional art here in the boardroom this evening, and Mr. Millis, do you have information on the art teacher that's helping? The us? art teacher is uh, Mrs. Goss, Teresa Goss, and... I know she's at Crestdale, and I'm not sure if she's another building, but probably. Um, but I've seen her work out at Crestdale. So um, each month we showcase uh, artwork around the district from students. And um, uh, we've probably failed to mention a few of those names in, in recent weeks. But um, these uh, would be elementary students and their artwork and want to recognize that work and as our um, joy of learning for this month and continue to watch for the artwork. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are ready for our first public commentary. Um, so anyone, do we have anyone signed up? Or anyone wishing to speak? No. Okay, we're ready for our consent items. <clears throat> And um, on those consent items are approval of minutes, human resources with an addendum, accounts payable, <coughs> filing of reports, monthly financial report, and field trip approval, Skills USA. So, do I have a motion? Motion made by <coughs> Jeff Slifer, seconded by Dixie Robinson. Comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Now we're ready for our action items. Action item. Our first is donations. 
Um, under donations tonight, we have quite a few that um, are area businesses that donated or sponsored the BPA Shamrock 5K, 10K run. And um, the total of those donations uh, was $3,700. And we want to thank Abbott Laboratories, Wetzel Family Auto Crews, Richmond Baking Company, Primex Plastics Corporation, Reed Hospital, Hills Pet Nutrition, Holland Colors, First Bank Richmond, PJ's College of Cosmetology, B&B Construction, Paint the Town LLC, Web & Associates, Hoosier, Hoosier Container, um, Tham LLC, which is also known as Mancino's, Natco Credit Union, Richmond Oral Surgery, West End Bank, and Wolverine for those donations. We also want to thank Donna Spears for a donation to the RCS marketing area. And the total of the donations this month is $3,800. We want to thank all of our community partners and contributors for their generous um, donations to RCS. And I ask tonight that the board approve the $3,800 in donations. So moved. Motion made by Aaron Stevens, seconded, seconded by Suzanne Derengowski. Comments or questions? Well, then thank you very much. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <coughs> Motion carried. Okay, the next thing that I have is an update to the facility use fee schedule. Um, this went out to you for review a few weeks ago, and um, now I ask for formal um, approval of this fee schedule. Uh, the administrative guidelines have been updated and are ready for posting as soon as approval happens. We also will be correcting the um, forms that we currently use to match this fee schedule as it's approved. So I ask for the board's consideration and approval tonight. Okay. Motion made by Dixie Robinson, seconded by Aaron Stevens. Comments or questions? I have a question. Jeff. Uh, the only question I have is is um, on the <coughs> on the fee schedule. I'm assuming that the hourly rate covers our our average cost for those personnel is that how that fee was established it does um, we actually took all of the staff that are in those departments and um, we established it as the highest salary of who could work um, and any associated benefits with that position that would be required um, that's how we came up with that fee okay. so all of our costs will be fully covered very good thank you mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, our next is the garrison property uh, recommendation. And the recommendation uh, tonight is to approve the sale of the garrison elementary school property to Mint Management LLC for the sum of $66,000. We've been taking bids and uh, uh, could not get this in your packet on Friday because we're still working, but. Uh, that's our recommendation at this time. Okay. A motion. A motion made by Jeff Slifer, seconded by Kelly Baumgartner. Comments or questions? The only question, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The only question I had is I'm assuming that it's been completely through Mr. Cross's office and everything is. Well, it's not going to be done by your motion. <laughs> that that will be the award, and then the work starts. But uh, the process was quite interesting because I, in my 30-some years, I think it's one of the few times I've seen cross-bidding and actual interest in something that a That's public awesome. entity has to sell. So uh, we kind of had to take a look at the statute and I would say somewhat improvised procedures that would be fair to all participants and make sure everyone had an opportunity to uh, be fully informed of the bidding process. and. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, I, uh, I think the taxpayers were the winners in this because if you recall the joint appraisals we had from Mr. Napodi and the gentleman from Muncie United Escape United Appraisals. United. Or, yeah, appraisals. United. Uh, this is uh, a bit higher than they projected the, the fair market value as it sits, as it's as is. Uh, so uh, I think the process was good. I thank the bidders for their participation. and uh, I. I know of no reason why the board should be reticent in making the award, and then we'll proceed to closing in due course. Thank you. Suzanne, did you have any? No. Aye. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <coughs> Motion carried. 
guess this is the last time we'll have the superintendent search update. I, I think so. I think so. <clears throat> well, um, we let it out. We have um, released uh, the name of our candidate, <clears throat> Mr. Todd Terrell, and um, what I will do is just go through now the rest of the process. Um, on April the 28th, um, this next week, uh, at 6 o'clock, we will have a special uh, public hearing uh, on his uh, contract, and um, that has been publicized, and, um, and we're ready to do that. And then on May the 5th at 2.15, we will have a special board meeting. Um, that happens to be right before our celebration of excellence, mm -hmm. um, where we will approve uh, the contract of Mr. Terrell. And um, I will say that um, going a little bit further, um, we are planning some, um, some special uh, meetings uh, and meet and greets uh, for Mr. Terrell in the, in the upcoming days that um, we will be talking a little bit more about um, because we want him to um, be introduced to um, not only our teachers and our staff and administrators, but um, we're going to be introducing him to our students uh, who had a part in our student forums who um, uh, where they um, gave us ideas of what they would like to see in our next superintendent. And so we want to give them the opportunity to um, know that this really happened. And uh, so we will be uh, giving our students an opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Terrell. And, um, and so we have lots of, um, lots of upcoming um, events that will be taking place to introduce Mr. Terrell to our community. Great. So, thank you. Any, anybody else want to say anything? We will um, we'll talk more um, <laughs> when we approve his contract on May the 5th. And uh, he will be here uh, and be introduced. So, that's, that's that. So we're ready for... We're moving into our work session. Okay. Technology for freedom of support. Um, and as I also have learned as we've gone through this, technology that supports phone service and all sorts of things. Yeah. So uh, we're going to begin first uh, this evening actually talking with you, and we have some outstanding presenters here to help us, uh, our, our e-learning specialists, as well as Mr. Millis and uh, Mr. Tidrow. Uh, but our approach tonight was to talk with you about what is, what we have right now, and particularly what we have in, in source technology and how it's impacting classrooms. And once we have done that with our video and discussion, then we would talk with you about the budget and possibilities as we move forward. <coughs> That's the scaffolding for our, our work tonight. Well, when we were given the task to present on technology, um, I think our, our goal here is to just really sort of give you a window, both a visual and some information into um, technology as it exists in the classroom today. And so as a team, we began meeting. And one way that I kicked it <coughs> off, because I'm sometimes removed from areas that kind of report to me, but I'm not always there, um, I sent out a series of questions to them to respond to. So that's kind of where we started. And um, you received those in your board update. I don't know if you could follow all of it, but I would hope there was enough information there that kind of <laughs> can follow the logic of that. And um, then also we began talking about um, really where are we? And I think there are several major themes that kind of stand out right now. <laughs> and, and one, there's a lot of talk out there about one-to-one. -one. and. Um, I think one-to-one -to, -one to a lot of people is students um, ta having a laptop, a personal uh, computer device, and going from class to class, having that with them all day long, and then having that have access at home and take it home with them. And there are examples in school corporations around the state where that is occurring. Uh, we have a, a pocket of that in our district at Hibbard 
with our early college students, and that was uh, the result of a grant that we received several years ago. Um, we are not there, and maybe that has been, and part of it, and the main reason has been financial. We just have not had the funds to support that. But also, maybe that has been a benefit because we have had our e-learning specialists, I'll introduce them here in a second, travel around the state, visit different districts. Uh, Mr. Tidrow has done the same. And I think a lot of these districts faced challenges when they did that. And it, it seemed like it was almost uh, competition. And, you know, we're one-to-one. -one. So they put those devices out there without the proper training, with teachers, without the technical support that's needed, uh, the technical side of repairing, what do you do when they, uh, screens are broken, things like that. And I'm not sure all of them had that quite figured out. And now they have the task of having to replenish those because they're three and four years into it. And so now, how do we do that? So um, this has given us a chance to pursue what we're going to refer to as uh, daily digital access. And that's been our goal for the last couple of years is to provide those um, technology devices, whether it's an iPad or a laptop, into the classrooms. And often those are with carts and have uh, either daily access or uh, periods of time when they can use them. Um, what we want to do also is just give you a review, really, of how, how often that occurs in the devices that we have and where that's at. And so I'm going to introduce several people here. Mr. Tidrow um, is our facilities and um, maintenance um, director and uh, also has been our technology director and that is still under um, his umbrella. Um, Kirsten Phillips is one of our e-learning specialists that we hired for this current year. And, uh, and then Kevin Shamel also, and these are two people that we felt we just had to have <coughs> them because of their classroom experience. And they've been very busy this year uh, doing so. So I will turn the next phase of this over to our team and we'll go through some information. Thank you, Mark. Um, we had some students up here talking about their successes at the national level, at the state level, and so forth. And keep in mind that those, several of those students, many of those students, have daily digital access where they are, whether it's in an AutoCAD lab or in Denise Selm's yeah. lab. Those have day, daily digital access. Now, they're workstations, of course. They're computers. They, but every time that that teacher needs to instruct something or every time that student needs access to a computer, <coughs> they have it. So at the high school, we have the career center and so forth. We have the, the CAD lab, the, the STEM and so forth. So they're, having, they're reaping a lot of benefits from having access to that day, daily digital access. So what uh, the team did here is put together some, uh, put together a video here uh, that we're going to show in a second. But uh, there's, a, there's, there's several slides here that you're going to see. And then afterwards, um, Mrs. Phillips is going to break it down and explain each of those slides. So, so just enjoy the slides and the, and the little uh, uh, call-outs there, but she's going to break it down afterwards. So, um.
One thing to keep in mind is that looks like we have full coverage in every classroom, and we do for those time beings that you saw it in there. So one of the, one of the discussions we'll have is, is how we want that impact every day uh, when, when those students need it. So. Wonderful, thank you. At the very end of that, there was a hashtag RCSE Learn. So I hope from our last work session you remember how to follow a hashtag. If not, contact Kevin or I and we'll be glad to show you how to do that because we try to tweet out pictures as often as we can on a weekly basis of what we're doing in the classroom. Um, so Kevin and I are here to share what we have been doing in the classroom. And right now, we have 33 iPad carts in our district. And we've learned a lot this year. Um, one of the, the uh oh, she's been, um, one of the largest um, learning opportunities we've had this year is the learning management system. My big campus is an example of a learning management system that the state um, endorsed this year, and we know it's going away. But it doesn't matter what type of learning management system we're going to transition to; it's that we have one. What we have found it's a critical tool to connect the technology and the curriculum into that into that learning environment. It's also like a, it's a curriculum tool that guides your instruction. As you can see in the pictures, there's discussion boards. It opens opportunity for students to collaborate with students, students and teachers, and teachers to parents. So some examples of how we've used My Big Campus this year with teachers. We have teachers putting out web pages. So if you go onto our website, our RCS website, you can go to different buildings and you'll see a My Big Campus tab. There you will find newsletters, you will find resources for parents um, and web links for parents to view. Um, we also have discussion boards going on, so book talks going on in a discussion type of atmosphere um, in, on the iPad. Um, we also have schoolwork so they can um, create essay uploads, true, false, multiple choice type questions, and then the teachers assign it, they do it on the device, they upload it to the, te to the teacher, and then time management is a critical piece, you know that, with the teachers, and so that saves them time as far as um, schoolwork assignments. Yeah, um, just to, to, to go back to the, the idea that it's going away, um, my big campus it was an add-on for our, for our web filter that we, we purchased to support our district. It was an add-on product. Um, that they offered to their customers, <clears throat> they, they realized that that wasn't necessarily a part of their business model. So they, they announced to the districts uh, a number of months ago that they will no longer be offering that, um, not just for free, but at all. So many districts, um, Mr. Millis and Mr. Tidrow, have sat in on, on districts that are literally scrambling, trying to figure out what do we do now. It's become such a critical part of how we do business at school we, we, what, do we go, what do we go with? Um, one of the benefits of my big campus was that it was free for us, um, but it gave our teachers and students an opportunity of what it means to organize your classroom in a digital age, um, how, to, how to have more real-time um, um, feedback and real-time communication. So we're in the process right now of evaluating a replacement because it has become a critical tool in environments that, that our teachers need it, and we want to be able to provide that. So if you see conversations in the future about an LMS, um, it is important. It goes hand in hand with the device. Um, our next picture displays the media center personnel. So at the beginning of our deployment, that person is critical when you're talking about the carts going in and out of the media center. That person needs to make sure that the cart is plugged in for the whoever is going to be the next person to tackle that cart. Looks at the calendar, see who's going to be using it. If they're not using it, they'll use it in the media center. We also have the media center personnel delivering digital literacy skills. So here you have an example of Ms. Dennis. Um, she does a great job delivering Microsoft type of a Microsoft type of environment for students, Excel, PowerPoint presentations with her fifth and sixth grade intermediate students. If you were to ask the teachers whether they have daily digital access or they get the cart, what's the number one thing that you see with that tool? It's engagement. Um, here's an example of a third grade classroom at Fairview, they're doing a Kahoot. So on the smart board, there's a question. It's a gamification type of app. There's a question that the teacher has posed. There are four responses, and within those responses, they are color-coded, and they also have a symbol. So you can use it K through 12, depending on the level of your reader. Um, but it's the first one to get the answer right, and then it comes up with a leaderboard. But if you look at their faces, they are all engaged. There is one little kiddo without his iPad. I don't know the answer to why he doesn't have his iPad, but his eyes are definitely on his partner's iPad. So. <laughs> The engagement has been a, a critical piece when we're moving forward with the deployment of how the, the technology is in interacting with the students in the classroom. Um, a natural byproduct of this is when, 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 we, when we go out and we really, you know, prime the pump for our, for our teachers and our learners to how we can use these effectively <coughs> in class, 
um, we, we're all very discreet that, that, that if an explicit if if you cannot meet the expectations there's an immediate consequence that consequence is everyone else will be able to participate in this learning style you can watch um, the, the students have stepped up and and monitored and policed their own classrooms and again we don't know the story of this kid but he really looks like he'd like to be using the iPad um, <laughs> as opposed to maybe a traditional uh, form of instruction. We're also opening the doors to different ways to do research in a collaborative way. So on the left hand side, the picture you see first graders at Westview, um, they're actually using World Book Online and they're studying a state. So we're not waiting for that I encyclopedia in the library anymore. We're actually able to get up. You're not sitting at a desk anymore. They're mobile. Um, that must be how they want to learn. Um, they're they're still at that same level. They'll, they're still at the substitution level. They're still doing the paper pencil type of activity, but they are at that beginning level where they're looking at the online um, encyclopedia to do their research. We also have two collaboration stations in our district, one at the high school and one at um, Hibbard. It allows four devices to be connected to the collaboration station. You can have four different students working on the same research project and you can toggle back and forth in between their device and see it on the screen so they can work together. Um, but still have their integral piece that they're working on. And then at the right hand side, you still need to pull in your curriculum, your books, and your different materials that you have for your resource. But that, that device is now becoming your notebook. We've seen the evolution of science notebooks going from the paper pencil into the digital format. Um, and so this is just an example of a way to do research. Smart boards may be the only enhancement you have right now in your classroom because you can't get a car every day in your classroom. So the smart boards are in every K to six classroom. This is an example of a kindergarten classroom having a brain break. But on a daily basis, you should be able to walk through specifically our elementary buildings and see our digital curriculum displayed on the smart board. Um, and that interactive piece is enhanced even if you don't have the cart with the individual daily access, you do have your smart board um, that projects your curriculum for you. And as we move forward in our curriculum decisions, the majority of our curriculum decisions are going towards this um, digital field. And then, of course, our modeling lessons, I don't know why the only one I have is when I'm pregnant, but um, our coaching <laughs> sessions this year um, have been providing modeling, um, support for our teachers. We are the resource. We know our teachers are busy. They don't have time to look for these specific things. We want to be that backbone for them. We want to say, what skills are you looking for? Let us help you, and here are some suggestions. At the beginning of this process, and it is a learning process, Kevin and I decided we would split buildings and would be there certain days. And that worked for some, but not for all. And so now we're doing the coaching cycle where it's appointments, and I can go for three days with a teacher, and we can see what they need, we can model and suggest, and we can be there when they try it on their own. Because you know technology never works when you're by yourself. So having that extra set of hands in there when they're exploring those new resources. Um, I am not pregnant in that picture, um, <laughs> but what, for clearing that what up. happens is, is we don't feel comfortable teaching that which we don't know. Um, and a lot of teachers, when, when they talk to us, they say, I'd like to use the iPads more, but I'd like to use the computer lab more, but. So our job is to, you know, listen, and we can't just transfer our ideas of how we would run a classroom onto them. Um, that's not as effective as listening to what their major obstacles are and working through that, whether it's their own familiarity with it, whether it's worrying about how certain students will treat the devices or if they'll be able to stay on, on, um, on, um, on task. So what we do in our initial stages is we teach the procedures so they can understand that you, know, you have to be very explicit in what you expect, set, set the ground rules, and hold everybody accountable. But they are pleasantly surprised the majority of the time that their kids can actually do this. So it, 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 it shows them that it can be done, and we're there to support them as, they, as we transition that onto them so they feel more comfortable. Um, the next two slides are integrated, but yet they're separated. So we're going to talk about differentiated instruction with technology, but we're also going to talk about individualized instruction. Um, MassSpace is a program that you're familiar with. Um, it was presented to the board a couple of weeks ago. So this is an example of how Mrs. Wagner differentiates her instructions using MathSpace. And the middle picture shows her iPad in front of her. She's getting real-time data. So in a math field, when you are on number two and number two is wrong, number three is wrong, before that child gets to 15, you need to have that teachable moment right then and there with that child. So this program, like many others that are out there for the iPads, gives you that real-time data 
um, to be able to drive your instruction and inform your instruction right then and there. Teaching also looks different. You can see that she's sitting one-on-one -on -one with a student in an iPad. Teaching does look different when you're, when you're on a device and you're working one-on-one -on -one instead of presenting content to the entire classroom. Um, and so that's different in differentiated instruction. We have this goal for students with standards. And so with differentiation, we set that scaffold for each student to get to that goal. But when you go into individualized instruction, we're now changing the choice. The choice now goes to the student. I have math instruction for you. I have this goal for you. But I'm going to give you five different programs to get there. I'm going to give you extra math. I'm going to give you Moby Max. I'm going to give you an application that works on math fact fluency. So if that's your goal, here are five different ways. I'm still going to get the data that I need to guide your instruction to make sure it's differentiated and to make sure you're there at that goal. But now you choose. The ownership of the learning now goes back to the student of how they're going to get to that um, end goal. And the other, go ahead. No, go ahead. The ABC mouse is another example. So instead of you're, you're working on a phonemic awareness skill with a class of kindergartners and you have three that can't get that K sound, you pull them and you work on an individual skill with those three instead of repeating, um, doing it again with the whole class. And so it's just a booster to your, to your education. And obviously, if you don't have iPads, you can still do that individualized instruction with your smart board as well. I, I spent most of the day today um, working with one of the um, high school English teachers. He was, he's piloting our first cart that we've put in the buildings. Um, we're really running a stress test to see how it performs. On paper, we can try to predict how it's going to perform. <clears throat> now we actually have it in place. We have him trying different things with his students. We have them all trying to watch a video, and we have them all trying to look for something on Yahoo. So just really varying the, the activities. But his whole, he, he was always very positive, and his demeanor was very progressive. But his excitement today, and, and what he said to me after three class periods, and he's only had them for about three days, he said, I have completely changed how I think about my role in the classroom. I will very rarely refer to myself as a teacher anymore because it's more about the learners and and you can give them a variety of ways to access the information that's what's important not what I say or how I say and if you don't get it my way sorry he knows that we need to give multiple opportunities for a child to learn the skills and learn the content and and having that daily digital access he can do a lot more on the fly instruction where he's able to have them do a search, have them all find different sources, and then compare. So he's able to teach these digital citizenship skills on the fly as well as, as, as planned. So that's a, a great model that we hope to spread throughout the district. We're also challenging our teachers. It's no longer <coughs> the clipboard with the large stack of spreadsheets that you take to the meetings to look at data. All the data is digital. And so <coughs> we have a 65-inch monitor in the Crestdale Conference Room that the teachers now air, airplay their iPad um, their iPad results onto that monitor and you can go back and forth with all the different teachers and they can um, pull up their data and they can talk about kids and that, and that can really inform their instruction. The more we look at data, um, the better informed we are as teachers. And so we are challenging our teachers as far as how they're looking at data and what ways they're presenting data. Last one, sir. Okay. So we've seen examples of how it's being used. It's one thing to say it, it's another to show it. Um, some of those pictures are a result of us doing the teaching. Some were us walking in and observing, or shadowing, or, that way, or coaching. But like Rob um, mentioned, this unfortunately is not the reality in every classroom. There's a number of factors for that. But the most glaring is, is just the availability of devices. There's other factors that come into play, building readiness, um, building leadership readiness, teacher readiness, and student readiness. And the model that we've adopted in, in the district has allowed us to develop those, those local experts. They're the ones that are able to, to act as that unofficial mentor and leader in the building um, for teachers that want to engage and, and, and alter the way they're delivering content and having students learn. So what we've done is we've taken all of the, um, the elementary, uh, intermediate, and, and the high school, we've taken their floor plans and this is one representation of how you can see what is in each building and how it's distributed. Now, one of the most glaring things you'll notice is that there's no two buildings, buildings that are alike. And, and not only the, the, the quantity of devices, but how those devices are being allocated. We can give recommendations to building leadership 
based on some of the technical needs to maintain the devices. But we've given autonomy to the building leadership to decide what is the best way to distribute those. Are they in carts that need to stay together? Are they in small sets that can be used for intervention and special ed? This is a moving target, and this is definitely something that is an interim model. Our ultimate goal is to make sure every classroom has its own set, every specialty area has its own set, every intervention and special ed classroom definitely has its own set. So I've included maps of all the buildings in your packet. We've chosen to highlight a few just so we can, you can understand the legend and some of the notes. So Charles Elementary has a total of three carts. Um, each cart in general has 26 iPads. They all look the same. When we deliver them to the building, they all look the same. And as buildings um, request to have certain apps put on, then we have a, a, a tool in place that allows us to remotely install apps. So we no longer have to be on site to make sure those apps get on the iPads. Um, so, what, so what happens is in that particular building, the building leadership recognize that third and fourth grade developmentally and with taking testing uh, requirements into consideration, the ability to, to navigate a digital assessment is critical in our third and fourth grade. She made the decision to take two carts that were new to the building this year, dedicate one to the third grade and one to the fourth grade. And instead of just saying, work it out amongst yourselves, I get the cart on Monday, you get the cart on Tuesday, actually through the input of the teachers, they came to the conclusion that if we had a set of eight or nine iPads every day, we can use them for individualized and differentiated learning. We can use them for stations. We can use them for partner projects. But if we do need a whole class application, such as assessment, such as whole class projects, communication, or when you're teaching a new app or a new program, to have that flexibility that I only need to work it out with two other teachers in this case to say, could I have the cart on Thursday? So that model has been in place for about a month. And every day that I've been there, in one of the three classes, the devices are being used. So that's great to see. The rest of the building, we have one cart uh, in this building. And it is shared by the, in, in the rest of the building, 15 classrooms. So they, they make an appointment on the calendar, see if it's available. Hopefully that matches when they need it. It also, hopefully that they're not sick or the wireless goes down or any other thing that can come up that can ruin th the actual um, use of it. But what we're finding in areas that is more constant and they have it every day, if an app doesn't work, if a technology doesn't work, if the wireless is down, if the teacher's sick, you know what, we'll try it again tomorrow. So that flexibility has really been empowering for our teachers. The other uh, set we have in that building, we have a set of eight iPad minis, which are smaller versions. And that's actually stationed in a first grade classroom. And that particular teacher had demonstrated an eagerness and a willingness to, to really use this to, to, to make her you know, instruction even more effective. So that's the, the model in that building. Is there any questions about Charles? We could look at a couple other examples. If you have questions, please, please let us know. Fairview, um, again, K to four. And the way the building has decided to allocate its resources is very different. Again, recognizing that third and fourth grade developmentally and in preparation for testing um, can benefit the most from that daily digital access. They've taken their total of five carts and dedicated one each in each third grade and fourth grade classroom. Now fourth grade has the iPad Airs, which are the standard size iPads. Third grade has the iPad Minis, smaller version. Um, but the, the, the transformation that, that, that Kirsten has seen in those teachers and those kids that have that consistent daily access, um, it really is becoming a, an educational and instructional necessity, not a novelty. The rest of the uh, building shares that additional cart. So 11 classes share that cart. Now what the building also decided to do was allocate um, the a set of 10 iPad minis for their special, or iPad airs for their special ed intervention. So it's, we call it a microwave. It's about the size of a microwave, bless you. It has about, it holds 10 to 12 iPads. So as a teacher needs it, that's in the special ed or intervention department, which arguably those students are the ones that can definitely um, um, benefit uh, the fastest. Um, 
they take the ones that they need, they return them at the end of the day, they plug them in, they're charged, they're ready for the next day. That's how they've decided to allocate them in that building. Yes. While you're still on Fairview, I, I, um, last week I visited a couple of those classes, and it's just really great to see how engaged the students were um, with, with their iPads while learning, but also exploring as well. And a you know, side note, I was in police uniform and I walked in and, you know, in years past, you know, the kids would just totally take their eyes off what they were doing and focus on me. It was kind of like I was just an afterthought because they were so engaged in what they were doing in there. And it's obvious that, that this technology makes learning fun and engaging. And, and, um, and that was not only by the uh, students who are English primary language students, but also English as second language students as well. So, the the ability to indi individualize and address students where they are and what they need, with the, the myriad programs and apps that are available, um, it really is a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, re regarding question, yeah, um, could you explain the difference of the number of carts um, per school? That's a great. I was at, you read my mind. I was getting ready I, I to do say that. that. Off. There are uh, the, there is no single funding source for these iPads. They've been they've been funded from, from a variety of of um, in a variety of ways. Um, some district title money, building level title money. Buildings have have, have dedicated their own building uh, funds um, to to supply more. <coughs> so, Dr. Parker and and Mr. Millis could talk a little bit more about. You know how that equity, if we want to call it that, um, um, is, is is dealt with. Over the last two years, we've um, looked at our carryover dollars and tried to use those to support bringing technology to school. So um, last year and this year, we were able to put one iPad card in each of the six elementaries and then one each in each of the two intermediate buildings. Um, our schools that are bigger and have higher poverty rates have more money and so they've been able to um, yeah <laughs> use that money to purchase more iPads for their buildings now Charles is um, one of our um, schools that doesn't get a lot of money but they made it a real priority this year and so that's why they have that additional iPad cart they use their building dollars um, Fairview I would say was probably the first to begin using title funds to support iPad purchase and um, that's why they have more so and Dennis and Tess have both used quite a bit of their funds too. Now I will add to that that it is getting more and more difficult to use title funds to support technology because the last two times we've put technology in our title plans, it's been rejected and we've had to justify it. And the question they ask is, what do you do with your technology dollars? And so we have the answer for that tonight. Um, moving Thank on you. to the intermediates, this is, this is Dennis. Um, Dennis has four iPad carts and two carts of laptops. And even though they're, they're technically shared devices amongst the whole building, that's why it's, it's blue, because there's an immediate curricular need, you'll typically find an iPad cart in a math department because of math space, um, quite frankly. And it's creating a from our perspective, a great um, problem. The problem being that I actually got an email this afternoon from a teacher that was venting his frustrations that he and his, his colleagues had about never being able to <laughs> check the card out because it's being used. It's a great problem to have because we know the demand is there. So as we move forward, it makes the most sense to place these devices in the environments where they can, the, they, they can be used um, immediately where the demand is there. Don't plant it hoping that they get used. Plant it where it can be used because we have the curriculum to support it. Um, so the, the same is true for the, the, the two carts. Those are also uh, checked out, the laptops. Uh, the high school is a, is a very interesting entity. We have obviously the largest population of students and we have the largest population of devices, but the device to student ratio still isn't where we need it to be. So right now, prior to the English language arts project, we, we had a very solid um, mobile device um, presence. Our, our science department, there's six um, sets of netbooks that were purchased, what, five years ago? About four years ago. Um, our, our project Lead the Way Biomed um, class has a set of laptops. 
Um, our early college classes had um, iPad carts. Um, those were originally a one-to-one. -one. We've since brought that back into, a, in a, into a, a daily digital access model, so they're here for them to use when, they, when it makes um, instructional sense to do so. And, and now we've, we've added the additional um, English language arts laptops, bringing our total of, of 13 iPad carts. Um, there, there's two shared iPad carts on the second floor the humanities department uses, and those are actually uh, generation one iPads, so those are quickly becoming end of life, but they are there, and there is still a lot of valuable use. Uh, there's a smaller set of seven iPads, uh, and of course I mentioned the laptop carts and the netbooks. So you can see that's uh, the, the science department, the, the project lead the way, and then our, our um, early college is there. On the second floor, uh, we're spread out, uh, mostly English. We have Emily Chereau over in the, over in the business department. Uh, she will be receiving a laptop cart as part of the English department. And she's another one that's just ready to go, ready to go. She probably could have led the training that we put on yesterday for the English department. <coughs> that develops that local leadership. We have a pod of um, English teachers here, and then Jeremy Hill's room down there. Um, rooms that currently have an iPad cart, such as the early college rooms or the, the um, Jeremy actually has one down there in his room. Those are going to be repurposed within the building, most likely in the math department, because again, they have the most immediate need um, mm -hmm. using the math space curriculum. And then there's the third floor. That's where I've been, we've been spending a lot of time making sure that as we expand this beyond one classroom in the English department, that we can repeat the successes in every room. And then we can, we can learn from, from that as we expand it to other content areas, other core classes. Should I ask my funding question now, or is there going to be a time for later? We're going to do funding next, if that's okay. We can, but maybe, we can. maybe we hold a little bit, because I think we'll, we'll kind of segue into that, um, as I think they complete showing some information on some surveying they did and the readiness mm, level we're at. Just so, so, so I don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it'll be there. When I look at Robbie, goes, <laughs> um, we, we wanted to know how we were doing, um, our department. Uh, we, we really didn't have anything to compare it to. And as professionals, you always want to know, are you being effective? And how do we measure our success? And our success is measured by the increased use by teachers and students. Um, so we wanted to get some data on, is what the work that we're doing in our roles and is the work by, by providing more technology for schools? Our schools, is it having an impact? And what kind of impact is it? As we bring on digital curriculum, is that having an impact? So we conducted a survey. We sent it out to um, all the buildings and asked for responses from principals, teachers, and other assorted staff. Because it's not just teachers that are benefiting from this. Um, it's anyone in a paraprofessional role, instructional coaches, principals. They all are stakeholders in this. Um, we'd never sent a survey out before. We set the bar very low for the amount of respondents. Typically we say, how many will we get back? Well, six, one will be a reply all, and it'll be a question about their printer. So <laughs> we, we make these predictions. But to our surprise, within 48 hours, we had over 160 responses. Oh, nice. So when people give you feedback, it's for one of two reasons. They have something really great to tell you, or they have something they want to get off their chest. So with one eye closed, we peered at the results, and our questions were, were quite telling. Um, the first question, and this is in your packet, so comparing your use as a teacher from last year to this year, how much has your use increased? 52%, I always stare at the largest numbers, 52% had some increased use. So obviously as we develop these and get a little bit more granular, we want to find out why. Is it because of the support we've been given? Is it local support like an instructional coach or another teacher leader in the building? Is it the fact that now we have a digital curriculum in English language arts? Is it that you're becoming more familiar with the tools that we already have? Or are your students demanding it? What is it? But 36% had a significant increase in their use. Now we didn't quantify that. Um, we wanted to keep it simple. This gave us the information that we wanted. The next question, I wanted to quantify this a little bit. So if your classroom was equipped with enough devices for every student to use every day, how would that impact the frequency of use? Because one of the largest, uh, one of the most popular re rebuttals we get in our yeah, but 
I'd use it, but is I don't have it every day. I can't get good at something if I don't have time to make mistakes on it. Teaching procedures, classroom management, making it a tool and not a novelty takes time and consistent access. The results here um, back that up, back up that claim. 79% of our teachers say it would have a definite impact. Again, this is the sample size of 162 uh, student teachers that responded. They would use it daily for delivering content, assessing, learning, and communicating. 20% some impact. They would use it for assessments and research. And there are gains to be made there, whether it's saving on paper costs or toner costs, printer costs, or saving on time, the, the timeliness of reporting. And 1% no impact would not use. Now, I'd love to know why. It could be the content area that they teach. Maybe they don't have a perceived value or a need for it yet. Maybe it could be someone that is in the twilight of their career and maybe are counting the days and maybe um, feel like our efforts could go better for a newer teacher. Um, so I'd like to know what that is. I, I hope that it's not a arms crossed doesn't work. Um, I, I'm not going to try it. I, I don't know. So um, there, there's some anecdotal notes that we got and I've shared some of those with you and, and you have access to the entire list. We asked them to give a text um, some feedback. Oh. What are some successes and challenges? And it was optional. And usually on surveys, when you have optional responses, you don't have a very large um, turnout. We had 60 people that wanted to take the time to give us some feedback. And there are some in there that were, um, there weren't, weren't positive, so, but, it, but it's still informative. It tells us why they've chosen not to. Um, and one of it is the fear of change. If I invest the time and it goes away, I don't get that time back. So it's 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 realistic so uh, a student engagement um, what impact has it had on student engagement in your classroom and 78 percent um, the, the colors are way too close here but trust me that is increased engagement 78 percent and engagement can take many forms it can be I'm not off task it can be I'm actually engaged in learning it can be I'm listening it can be I'm not watching when the gentleman in the police uniform comes in engagement means I'm on task with what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and just judging by the pictures, those were not staged pictures. Those were real pictures. And the thing that st stands out at me as, as an educator is the smiles, people smiling while they're learning, not just the kids either, but the teachers. And that, that paints a great picture of engagement. 21%, um, there was no change in the, in the level of engagement. So maybe they were already really engaged before. Um, but Neither, there's only one iPad cart to share with 15 classrooms, and so getting it one or two times a month, you're not really going to see that change in engagement when you're fighting over getting that cart. So that's a great point. And I, again, I'm interested how someone's less engaged. That would be an interesting one to, to find out. As well. <laughs> so I'm not going to read through these. Um, we're adults; we don't need to be read too. But I've included these in the packet as well. I will highlight a few that were just very refreshing and, and, and gives credence to what we're doing, um, and talks about some of the important topics that that are now part of the dialogue the second one we use Twitter canvas Google Docs so collaboration and, and, and management we use technology every day um, that first bullet point we would love to implement tech daily but with few resources it's very difficult to put that in the students hands um, challenges at the bottom funding to add additional grade levels so the teacher they know building leadership they know funding is a critical part of this we want to make sure that we're maximizing the investment. And then references to My Big Campus. It's an amazing tool. My students and I really enjoy using it and encourages participation. You could, you could replace My Big Camp Campus with Canvas or Blackboard or Schoology. These are some other uh, learning management systems. It's not the product, it's the process. So we hope to use this momentum as we, as we move, move forward. Um, just examples of what they're using it for and and you know I, we always talk to kids that we say we're talk we talk to very important people all the time about how beneficial these iPads are how beneficial the laptops are I said but what do you think the number one question we get is are they being used and how are they being used because that's the prudent question responsible question to ask what's what's wonderful is now we can really have those questions answered um, the types of things that they're doing and how it's spreading throughout the buildings and throughout the district um, that question is is blatantly obvious what it's being used for now and 
Aaron had the chance to see it, so if anyone else would like the chance to see it, talk about Kevin Ryan, we'd be more than happy to bring you into a classroom so you can see the type of learning that's, that's occurring. And funding. Now we're going to put the fun and funding. Fun and funding. That's Thank you right. so much for your So, um, fun and funding. Uh, Mr. Stevens, when uh, <coughs> Mrs. Huffman was up here, mentioned some favorite teachers and so forth, and she kind of got teary eyed on that. Well, I, I feel the same way up here because we, I've been here for seven years, and we've, we've transitioned from different ways that we use technology, where it was kind of just in the business area, maybe in a teacher's area. But if you notice, they didn't really talk about uh, technology. They talked about what's called e-learning. We phased that in a few years ago when we talked about that digital conversion process in our classrooms. Um, and we've challenged each other at our meetings. We meet every week on e-learning and so forth. We've challenged to get rid of that e-part. We really don't need e-learning. It's just learning. And that tool should become invisible. And I think we're getting there. I think it's the part where those teachers are comfortable with things. Um, we, we, we have laptops here that, that you guys use on a weekly basis, bi-weekly. Uh, Mrs. McDermott's using a, a, a device over there, so we become more comfortable with it, and our students are, are getting that point as well, but we, we, we want to get rid of that E part. We just want to say learning, and I think we're getting there. Um, and I should also say that a lot of these things have just not happened overnight. Five years ago, this month or last month, was when the iPad was introduced as a tool for, or a, a device for entertainment, basically. Uh, it was a grown-up tool from an iPod. So uh, we introduced it, we, we kind of went out, kind of, you have these outliers that kind of experiment for you. We went over, we talked to Jeremy Hill uh, at the high school and said, if we get you a set of these things called iPads, will you use them? And you can show us what teachers can do with them, what students can do with them. And right away, one of his, two things he noticed about them this was even five years ago before apps were even built for education was that the kids were engaged and when they had a dual classroom with uh, Mr. Priest, Scott Priest, mm -hmm. and so the students stayed in that classroom and he said what happens during that uh, 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 period change, the kids stayed in the classroom. They didn't go out and mingle with their friends, they stayed on the iPad. So that was another way that he could take advantage of, of time management and so forth. So we, we've seen this transition, we have those outliers, and then when you have that, that need or then you have to look for the way to fund things. I put, a, I put a slide up here that takes us back a little bit of history, uh, 2006 through 2015. Uh, on the left-hand left side, our CPF dollars in technology were about 1.4 at that time. Okay, so uh, things have changed about the 2009 period. Uh, we went from about 1.4 down to 700,000 devoted to technology. Um, and, and since then, uh, circuit breaker hit a few years ago. And so the 2014 uh, one went down just a hair. We're down to about the $650,000 uh, annually uh, annual budget on our technology and maybe even 625 or whatever happens to our circuit breaker. So, <coughs> so. Oh. I'm sorry? I'm just saying I hope not. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want that bar to go back up. But I want to give you a, a historical uh, view of this. Okay, another piece of history, uh, and some of you were, were on the board at the time. Uh, in 2009, we came to you what we call the five key technologies. Uh, we had an infrastructure, we had uh, classroom equipment, we had systems that were, that were aging and dying, and so we came to the board and in 2009 asked for some, some allocations from the rainy day fund. Um, and uh, at that point, the, the, the board voted to um, allocate $1.36 million uh, to, the, to the technology department to upgrade specific things in the district that needed upgraded. Below there, we have a, a sustainability uh, forecast that we put together uh, for the use of these dollars. Most of that initial investment um, was, was used that first year. Uh, as you can see, $848,000 of it was spent on new student PCs. If you remember, we had some breakout sessions, and one of the complaints was that the teachers' computers could not be used. Well, what was happening was that we, we, we'd use those teacher computers for seven, eight, nine years, and then they would end up in the students' hands. Okay, so then the students would use it. So uh, we were on a 20-year replacement cycle for student PCs, which 
What we wanted to do was flatline that, was say, regardless if you're a student or a teacher, you get the same quality and, and vintage machine, that, because we all need the same, same quality and, and, and quantity. So we, uh, we invested 848000 for new student PCs that, in that year. Uh, and using some of our technology fund, that 700000 to upgrade our teacher machines. So we had a, we had a lot of exposure to new machines that, in, in, a, in about a two-year time frame. Uh, this <coughs> upgraded labs in the, the uh, buildings and, in, in, and at the elementaries and at the middle schools. It also um, set up student PCs in the back of the rooms, for example. They might have four or five, depending on how the uh, principal wanted that. We also upgraded some servers. If you were on the uh, board at the time, you remember talking about virtual servers. We did some virtual server upgrades and, and moved things over. Uh, another big line that we uh, were very worried about was the 160000 we spent on switch replacements. And if you remember, I brought a switch in. This is every wire you have goes into a switch, and then from there, things are consolidated to one fiber cable that comes over to this building and so forth. So those switches were dying about two per month. When one dies, that's, that's 48 people that can't get on uh, to the network or the Internet. So um, we used that money to do those upgrades. And as you can see, up and through 2014, we allocated funds each year to meet that, ne sustain that need for what's needed um, uh, in, the, um, in, in the district. The important line here is, is that $140,000, and, and in your board update this past week, uh, Dr. Poindexter pointed that out, that that's, that's kind of that remaining dollars that we have to use for PCs. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean student PCs. Sometimes it means uh, replacing uh, teacher machines or uh, administrator machines, uh, secretaries, principals, and so forth. So it does not necessarily always impact those devices inside um, the, um, the classroom as, as we saw. So m most of that rainy day fund was used before, uh, bef before the, uh, the end of 2010. So these other lines represented the CPF that we used every year. Okay, so now we move into, and I'll have to ask Mrs. Scalf to give us some, some real numbers on here for the, the total, but we moved into this new bonding phase uh, two or three years ago when we went to uh, renovating Crestdale, Dennis, and so forth. We took out $8 million total, or I'm, I'm looking at you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Karen, because something like that. 1.75 of that was, was, uh, was part of a technology bond. Okay, so what we do now with with that money is we, we sliced, sliced off about half of the CPF devoted to technology from for the CPF funds. Instead of 700 or 650, we, we now get that 300, 350, okay? After circuit breakers, about 300. We take 350,000 each year from that technology bond, add those two together, and that's how we now get that full 650,000 or 625,000. Uh, one clarification that we, we make a lot is that this is not in addition to that original 650 that was allocated <coughs> uh, each year from the CPF. This, this lets us use 300,000 or so from CPF in other areas, facilities and so forth, so it makes us a little more flexible there. Okay, so this is just a repeat, and I have a, a slide that, that's going to uh, come after this. We have some uh, funding commitments each year that we're committed to, whether they're reoccurring software or reoccurring hardware-related items, and that leaves us with about that $140,000 per year uh, that we have to uh, that flexible. So we're going to pass it around. This is, uh, you have seen this some. This is the uh, budget we have for actual purchasing software, hardware, uh, some services in the technology budget. Again, this includes the, the circuit breaker that we experienced last year, so we're down about the $650,000 uh, price range. So one of the questions um, I recently got was from <coughs> Dr. Parker. It's like, what, where's this money you have? What, why aren't you putting it into iPad carts and so forth? Now we have, we've, we've purchased some out of technology, but we wanted to show that there is a, there's commitments we have, there's the decisions that have been made um, that, we ha that we're committed to for some of that money. The, the top part of this graph shows our software commitments. Uh, Pearson GradPoint is a curriculum tool, courseware that's used over in the uh, high school, 
used in uh, uh, CYS. We use it even in the, uh, uh, over in uh, other areas, uh, alternative education. Our antivirus is a, is, a, is a reoccurring cost we have to have every year. Power School has an annual fee, about $26,000. Our light speed filter that uh, Kevin alluded to, this is a requirement by the feds to have uh, a filter on for our students. We want to have it as well for our uh, staff. That's $25,000 a year. Our Destiny software in our library, which is a um, uh, book management system, we can also use it for inventory, which is what we're going to start doing with our uh, iPads, laptops that are going to be carted there. They're going to be part of that uh, uh, inventory control system. And uh, our alert solutions, which is one call. So you can see that we have commitments that are beyond just putting hardware devices into classrooms and so forth, or into the business area, or into the operations area. Uh, and these are reoccurring, except for one line there, which is our perfect form, which is an online form tool that we're using right now. Uh, we have a commitment of about 180000 a year that, that from day one, we're, we're pretty much committed to, so, for that software. Uh, Board Docs is in there, for example. That's about a $9,000 investment uh, that, that we use, bus ball software and so forth. So, uh, If you look down below, we have some hardware commitments. We have a reoccurring maintenance cost on our warranties for Dell servers. These are things that you want to carry as long as you can, as long as Dell lets you use, do that, and as long as you can afford it, and as long as you have that uh, hardware, you want to have a warranty there. So that way, if it breaks down, uh, we have a, uh, a four-hour response. If the hard drive goes out, they will drive it up from Kentucky or over from Indianapolis, and we can put that in and, and keep the operations running. Uh, switch maintenance, uh, that's very important for our switches out there that are, uh, that are still under warranty. So you can see we have uh, a multitude of other things that are not just software related, but uh, we have commitments too. Um, towards the end, towards the bottom of that, the last five, six uh, rows, we have things like server memory upgrades. These are things, this is, uh, this is a one-time cost we did at the beginning of this year. As we were, um, uh, as we go into this summer, we're going to be upgrading power school, and part of that need is a memory upgrade and, and, and other needs that we have for our virtual servers. So uh, th these are not just one stick of memory. You have to go uh, 128 gigabytes and so forth. There's a ton of memory put in there, but it, but it, it's the needs we have for our for our district. Uh, believe it or not, we have a we're probably one of the biggest purchasers of batteries uh, uh, in the in the city here, and all of our um, UPS systems that that provide power after after the lights go down. We have those in, our, in all of our server rooms. We have uh, many in our switches and so forth. So these are things, as those batteries die, we have to replace them as well. Some are car battery size, some are smaller, but uh, we do have a, a large investment with that. So um, every two, three years, um, we're going to be seeing a wireless infrastructure upgrade of some kind. We are we're getting to the point where the average number of devices that people have is five. Mm -hmm. these, these devices are mostly wireless. Um, during a given day, we have over 700 guests on our public Wi-Fi area. Okay, kids, students now, maybe even some adults, they don't. They buy a, a smartphone. They don't activate it with their Verizon account or whatever. It's kind of a dead tool until they get into a Wi-Fi area, and then they get on that for free uh, data. Uh, and so we have that opportunity at the high school. They use. Uh, they're allowed to use their smartphones in certain classes or in passing periods. So every time we, every two or three years now, we're going to see an infrastructure upgrade. And um, it just, it also follows with the technology as well, uh, the capabilities that, are, that the wireless uh, will provide. So we, we want to be aware of that. We want to follow that along. Our uh, elementary, our, our middle schools have uh, very good Wi-Fi capabilities. We are building that capacity at the high school as we need it. So we were building that into those 13, 14 classrooms that are getting those uh, mobile devices right now. And then we're going to ex expand that as, as, as we also purchase more devices in that building. So, All right, let's go back. To, oh, um, Mrs. Morgison, you had a question about <coughs> funding. So I don't know if well, this is a place or? It's kind of about funding, but it's it's more about um, well, it's about funding. 
Um, <laughs> I, I get concerned when, um, because I'm thinking that this is something, um, technology is something that we need as much as we can possibly get in all of our schools for our students. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as though that um, that's what I'm hearing. It obviously increases student engagement. Um, it, there are just multiple reasons we're going to digital textbooks and so forth. So I get really concerned when I, I don't, um, w when maybe there isn't um, a plan and that we are allowing our building leaders to determine whether or not iPads or uh, devices are purchased. Because what if I'm, what if I don't really think they're that important? Or um, that I want to spend the money on something else? And I have teachers though that are wanting um, to be able to instruct using um, technology. So, so that's a concern. Can, um, can I reply to that? Yeah. Uh, we, we do not allow the, the, the buildings to willy-nilly buy anything they want. We do have some specifications that, that have to be met. We've, we've had some requests you know, we have they have a certain amount of money, and they've gone out and said, "Hey, I can buy a $69 tablet. Why can't I get that instead of a $479 iPad?" Well, we have some specifications, and and mainly it's because these do not uh, meet the needs of the curriculum or the assessment pieces that we have. So, um, we we do have some specifications there. We also know that in those lower grades, you know, your the primary up to maybe the fifth, sixth grade. Um, a laptop is probably not the best thing for them. We know that because we've tried that in some certain areas, and it just doesn't work. Um, and so we've, we, when there have been requests that way, we have said you really need to look at, look at an iPad or a, a mobile device or something that, uh, that is, that's conducive to that learning environment. Um, so I, I think we so, so maybe my question is more, so how are yeah. we going to ensure that, um, that we have, um, if we have two fourth grade classes, that we have one cart that those two can share. Whereas in another building, we may have five fourth grade classes and we still only have one cart that they can share. So how are we going to make our plan so that, um, that there is, that our students have equal access. And I know equity is not always equal. I under, I get that. But, um, but how do we ensure that if I'm going to this school that I have an opportunity just like Johnny who's going to another school? How do we, um, I think, I think part of that is just having the dollars available in an equitable fashion. We know that Title has put in a lot of money, but it doesn't cover some of our buildings. High school, for example, maybe not as much at Charles and so forth. So they have just limited funds. An iPad costs the same whether you have this much money or this much money, so they can only buy a certain amount. So what we have done is we have put together some, some scenarios here or some, some ideas on what, how we can get to that point. So. Um, I think you're asking how can we get that daily digital access and I f across you know pre-k through through 12 and I, I appreciate that I think that's what we're all trying to get to we've been very um, if we had the money we'd be there let's let's just put it that way we would be at that point where every kid had everything he needed at, at every time uh, but we don't have that kind of funding we don't have those opportunities so we've been very we have phased things in and we've been very targeted with with how we, we put those devices in there and I think also it, it goes back to what what buildings or what teachers what administrators are ready for that 
uh, device or set, set of devices. We don't want these things pushed in there and sit around for three months. We want them used as soon as they go in. So part of having that uh, kind of scout, we have the integration specialist with Jim Magoski, we, we have the e-learning specialist now, where they can see where those teachers now are saying, and they're kind of pulling that carts, and they're trying to pull that need in. And so we know that now that, that we've built that capacity over the last couple of years that now they're ready for that. If we would have put those in three years ago, they may not have been ready for them. So I think at this point we are ready for it, so I think it's a good time to talk about that daily digital access plan. So, But at this time I think what at least I have been able to determine with all of the background discussion and reading and trying to understand this is that in the last couple of years uh, we have moved quickly with uh, teachers recognizing and seeing the need to use the devices. It's really come on rather suddenly in the last two years. Up until then it was more gradual. And so the demand is much greater perhaps than right. we could have anticipated and the dollars are fewer perhaps than we could have anticipated. The part that has definitely created some issues among buildings is the amount of title money that a building gets based on the student population and the, the ways that, that they're using the money in that building. So some buildings would not have as much funding from title because it couldn't be allocated due to the ratio of, of the students with uh, free and reduced lunch, et cetera. Create some of that. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, <laughs> but I don't expect answers tonight. I just want to throw these out there. Because if we're moving to digital textbooks, that's, are we, is the infrastructure and everything that we have, are we ready for all of that in our buildings? And then if this is our plan A, you know, as a digital, having digital textbooks and so forth as each um, cycle moves on, mm -hmm. um, they do break down. I mean, I've, I've heard that I've been in buildings, it breaks down. Sometimes when a teacher, on the day a teacher's being evaluated, or, which is not a good thing, or they break down, and especially now that we're going to semesters, back to semesters, the class time is shorter. And there's a certain rhythm to a classroom, and so when things go down, all that's broken. And then you have to go to a plan B, and sometimes there's no plan B. We have older textbooks that we can go back to, but are we going to buy classroom sets of textbooks at least that a teacher, if things go down, that they could go to that so that they're the same? Or do they have to just make up a lesson <coughs> on the fly, on their feet? Um, well, so. Do you want answers now, or you? I mean, I don't. Before I don't we care. move on to your next question. Yeah, I don't care if we have them now, uh -huh. um, but it's just things I'm that's rolling through my head sure. about it. Uh, the teacher training and this transition with all this digital conversion, um, and then, like I said, the classroom time is going to be even less, and um, and then I have just some concerns about. Um, do we have enough people once we put all these computers out in all these classrooms do we have enough people that are going to be able to keep these up and running um, for classroom use and for testing when testing rolls around because because i know that's problematic sure so those are those are just okay. questions and then i have i had some other questions just about technology being used excessively you know where that's the only thing sometimes that would be used in the classroom because there's research coming out now on when that's all they use about short attention spans about the wikipedia problem um, that they think that's the true answers is whatever they read on the internet um, it, hindering your ability to write and analytically think and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing so um, those are just things I'm that's rolling around in my head <laughs> I can I can answer some of those I uh, 
as far as the support goes, you never have enough if you have 3,000 computers go down at once or you have a testing environment that we're starting tomorrow that is going to be Don't say it, don't say it. So, <laughs> well, I was in that once and I almost had a major heart right. attack. <laughs> you, you can have 3,000 people and you still can't solve that problem, I think. But uh, the reality is, is the industry standard for supporting technical devices, say uh, desktop computers, laptops, is, is about 500 to one. So every 500 computers you have uh, one support person. Uh, that number, if you, if, if you actually ask around the state, and, and every month I meet with a, a group of tech directors, what's your average? And the average really is about 1,200 devices to one. Uh, so that, that number of 500 was 250 actually a few years ago. It went to 500, now it's about 1,200. Uh, part of the reason is, is your support is different. If this machine breaks down, we're probably going to fix it. We're gonna, it's going to take some time to fix this one. Or if, if, if Ali King's device breaks down, it's going to take some time to get her back up and running because she has different needs on that computer. She has a lot of stuff saved as a building administrator. You know that. Mm -hmm. If that device fails and that's a student computer and everything is stored in the cloud, fixing that is a lot different. You either swap it out and you say just use this and get your, get your content or you can quickly image it. And you probably remember those terms we use image. You just erase everything on there and you put a new one and in a matter of you know, 45 minutes or something you got a new device ready to go. So the, the scenarios are different for s support but, I'm not, but we're also supporting other things. Mm -hmm. you know, we saw smart boards in the buildings. We saw other things that are not just devices that our technicians uh, support. So when you hit maybe that 1,200 device range additional, you, you probably want to look at different support scenarios. So Well, and when we're talking about funding and you look at all this and what we're going to have to do down the road mm -hmm. just to keep up, yes. it's where are we going to get all this money? <laughs> well, I think so. it's one of our discussions is when we, when we talk each, each year or a couple times a year about it, it is this, that is a serious question. And we're not the only one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same kind of questions when you're talking about maintaining facilities or maintaining the transportation fund. It's a different, you know, scenarios now than it was maybe 10 years ago when the funding was, was different. So, um, as, and so as far as, our, as far as that infrastructure goes, what, we, what we've done, I'm very confident that our um, elementary and, and middle schools have that infrastructure there. We might see some outages and so forth. We, we need to hear about those. We need to respond to those. Our high school, we're going through, it's, that is a huge building. We have 122 classrooms that we're, we're upgrading. Right. And as we, as we see on one of the scenarios here in our infusion of additional funding is, an, is the E-rate discounts. Now, uh, that discount process has changed this year. We're in E-rate two, so some of those uh, actual ways of using that is different. Our bear account is going to be a lot thinner uh, over the next few years. It could even uh, maybe disappear. but. Part of those E-rate discounts we're, we're putting in for this year uh, would, would do an overhaul of our Wi-Fi at the, at the high school. So that's, that's part of what we hope we get some approval on in that July time frame so they can, so they can, they can get those out there. So uh, the high school is a different animal. Um, when you're talking about uh, different mobile devices and the strategies for Wi-Fi, you have uh, coverage where you, you just want to make sure people can get on there. Um, and then you have uh, really concentrated capacity where you get 25, 30 devices, or maybe in those cases, maybe 50 devices if every kid has some kind of mobile smartphone or something they're, they're carrying with them. So uh, it's a it is a different animal when you're talking about uh, that, that Wi-Fi. So, uh, but part of our uh, guinea pig and part of putting out those devices in the, uh, in the uh, language arts area, we're working with Mr. Smith over there, and we're saying you're, you're going to help us build this capacity over here. It's, it might be rough that first couple of days, but we're going to get to the point where, you're, where your class is on there and these other 13 carts are out there and they're, and they're, they're doing what they need to do. So uh, it is a process. Uh, Mark, were, were you going to? Yeah, I was just going to respond to the curriculum piece. Oh, right. Okay. Really what we're talking about are teaching standards, learning goals, um, and digital or just content. Um, so some of those things are, are software pieces that have come out like math space uh, was designed by um, someone in Michigan I believe and um, um, Sam Thomas saw it at the mm -hmm. conference took it and they just started using it and they said this is really can substitute for a textbook now that's dependent upon them having 
devices, devices every day. Yeah. Now, they would have the textbooks to back it up, but really they've moved away from just using textbooks to more standard base covering content and going over it. Um, last year when we did adopt the language arts, when, when you adopt, they pretty much will give you the hard bound copies in most cases that, go, that would yeah. go along with the digital content. But I think what we're going to see, for, for a year now they've used the textbooks and uh, novels and things that go with that. And I, I believe we're going to see them with much more engagement and students being able to do so many more different things and the writing component just really expands what they're able to do and how it relates to the content. So um, I think once they make that migration, the textbooks will be collecting dust. So again, it's just, it's content, it's um, how they're using and learning the standards. Um, we're in, inter in an interesting spot with social studies. Um, the high school will be probably following a similar plan. Um, they like the Pearson and they'll have hard bounds, but there's also <coughs> digital content. Um, and, and I would see if we can get that access, the same kind of pattern. At the intermediate, um, we had a presentation by Discovery and it's all digital content. I think the teachers at TESS, some at Dennis, um, see that being very robust. But the question was, well, what if we don't have the devices yet? What are we gonna use for yeah. textbooks? So th they say you can use the um, projectors and you can do a lot of those things, print out first-hand documents for kids to evaluate. But also they have suggestions on how learning should take place. And it's not just, um, I think we got into that a little bit, just um, teacher delivery and lecture. It, it's more so doing it in such a way that kids are working in groups, coming together, coming to consensus, discussing an issue, responding to it online, um, responding to written responses, um, and getting that real-time information both for the student and for the teacher. Did they really understand what we just read? Let's take a three question thing in 30 seconds, you know, yeah, they were paying attention, no, they weren't paying attention. So it's, it's, it's about content and how that content's delivered and whether or not they're learning it. And so not everything could, not everything should be done. I think a lot of things could be done on, um, with technology, but I think there's a lot of learning that will go on that is, has to do with how you set up instruction. So I don't know if that helps, but, so, but right now, the textbook companies sort of match <coughs> those together. So they have the, the books when you purchase it, but they understand that at some point in time when you have enough devices, the choice will probably be the other because the kids will have access to a lot more. But in this transition time, will they get, uh, so far will they, they have, have books? There are some companies that are just all digital and they put a lot of money and invested a lot of things into that. So they probably are a little more engaging, but right now for us, that's, that's a question mark. Mm -hmm. Because well, I, I, I know they do break down and then you're, you know, there you are, mm -hmm. you, you don't know. Can I just ask yeah. uh, to expand on that? <clears throat> Your presentation is leaning towards the devices in school for students not to take them home. Um, as I listen to you talk about the content, the digital curriculum, and going away from the box, the, the, the textbooks, and which I agree that's where we're going, but how is that going to help the students if their device to, to connect to their digital curriculum is locked up in a charging card at 3.30 in the evening and they go home? I think we're just in a transition to get teachers and students um, using digital devices and curriculum so they know how to use them. And we obviously don't have the funds to give every student. That'd take three times what we're gonna present here today. Um, well, the reason why I asked that, because then now you're talking about digital access 24 seven. So now, so now we gotta ideal, talk about how- I don't think, if we did it today, and we, like some school systems, somehow came up with several million dollars and every student had a device. Um, we kind of experienced that at Hibbert. Until this last year or two, 
where now we've had some e learning people working with teachers on how it can be used. And right. have you looked at this app? Have you tried this? Have you done this? I think they kind of had devices, and a lot of the time they were play toys. But so um, I think going deliberately has been good for our school system, and I think continuing in that pattern until maybe a few years from now, but that's somewhat dependent upon how much we can um, have more access in the classroom. Down the road, we're going to, I mean, the more computers we get, they, they do have a, show, a, a life. Sure. And, and I guess I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to financially <coughs> keep up with all the repairs, replacements, um, software, on and on it goes. That is one of our biggest concerns is sustainability. It's not any good if you can't sustain it. Um, and what we know is, is five years from now, it could look totally different, right. at which point we want to be able to be flexible enough to model whatever we need to do to make the students' learning what it needs to be. So as we look at that piece of the planning, um, we have options, and we're looking at textbook fees. Those are not 100% funded options, but they are sustainable once you get past your initial um, piece. It is very deliberate if we go that route, um, and that's something that as we talk, we have to be very detailed and, and know exactly where we're going on that. Um, the other piece is is you have to talk about the fact um, of um, is it worth continual um, bonding? Is it something that you want to look at? Replacement bonding is what I kind of think of it as. It's something that you deliberately and intentionally take either each year or each period of years um, so that you can replace what you have, keep it going, do whatever you need to do next. Um, that's something that a lot of schools do and that's how they are sustaining this. Um, other than that, um, when we look at tax dollars, our area, it's not gonna grow in base right now. Mm -hmm we can push as much as we'd like to on new business and growth and new assessed value, but we have to do what we can do here um, and help where we can, but that isn't an option that we have. So when we look at dollars, that has to be off the table right now. Um, circuit breaker is very, very, very bad for us. And so that's something that as we look at all these options, we still have to consider that too. Um, there are options. They are things that we'll be discussing in the future and we'll be bringing. Um, we know how much a penny on the tax rate is, so that's something that we can look at. Um, if you want to know, it's about $140,000 right now um, per penny. So, But those are just a, the main options. Um, I have already contacted the banks that we work with, and they have leasing programs for schools. Um, like us to do technology but if we do that it's just borrowing the money they're one-year leases you pay it right back at the end of the year and you move on so that's something that is is nice the interest rate is very low it's a really good option if we know that we want to set aside dollars for that purpose but we have to look at that as being kind of a borrowing type um, of environment so we are looking at a lot of different options so that we can bring them to you, you can take a look at them, get more comfortable with them, and, and see where you feel like you would like to go. Um, but that's what we're looking at right now. It seems as though to me that, um, well, here's my question. So what are, what are our expectations? It just seems like before we can actually have a plan for what computers we need, what kind of computers, what computers we need, that we need to know what the expectations are for both our teachers and our students. So um, let's just say K2, what are our expectations technology-wise for our K through two students? or through our third through fifth, or sixth through eighth, or 
in high school. I haven't heard the plan as far as what a timeline, you know, uh, this year with what we have. We would hope that our K through student, K through two students would, and that our teachers would. Because I keep hearing, um, I often hear the teachers that are ready. Well, what about the teachers that aren't ready? And, um, and what about their students? And so I'm thinking that we need some kind of a plan, a curricular plan, uh, expectations um, that we need to be working toward. And then to me, that determines our purchasing. I, does that make sense? I, well, I think it makes perfect sense, and I think we can we can definitely uh, <coughs> qualify that. Part of that is goes to you know assessment, not just your annual assessments, but your daily assessments, your weekly assessments. Part of that expectation is there to do that online through some of our software that we've we've committed to SchoolNet. But and what so are our so. other expectations, technology wise? <coughs> well, um, you know, you know um, I, I'm just thinking that we have smart board so what are the expectations right. of of uh curricular wise how we use those smart boards our teachers all were given ipads what are the expectations that the teachers are to be doing with those ipads um if if we have um you know put carts in buildings what are the expectations that's that's what i don't know it just makes sense that we look at it from the curricular standpoint mm -hmm. and then that is what guides our purchasing and our the rest of our plan yeah. i agree with that part of it is having n newer curriculum uh, items available whether it's the houghton mifflin stuff that is um, online and supplements the reading components <coughs> as more multimedia Maybe it is the, um, uh, the the math software and so forth. So those those things are out there. I believe I that's where it goes back to. We're not talking about technology. We're we're talking about learning processes and making sure the students are learning, whether you're using a, a pencil or or a, a device and so forth. So. But well, shouldn't we, Richmond Community Schools, uh, put something down in writing as to what the expectations are curricular wise, mm -hmm. so that all uh, so that teachers parents students everybody knows what those expectations are or what at least what our goals are to that we're trying to <clears throat> attain and you know it may be on a uh, uh you know i mean obviously we can't do it um all at once but we could at least um you know have kind of a i guess a timeline of of what we're trying yeah. to the goals we're mm -hmm. trying to reach i think one of the things that that at least um as we were talking about how to get ready for tonight and and i would take some responsibility in our planning for tonight is uh as we talked about it we said if we don't have dollars it's not a plan we have to put dollars uh with what we have because we can't make purchases without dollars so we were trying to realistically look at the dollars that we have available at the present time and what we could possibly do. And we can't begin to do many of those things. Now I think what's happened, and it's, it's becoming very helpful here, is just the research that was done in preparation for tonight to start to look at the buildings we have from our elementary principals, what their needs would be if there were just money available. I could pull it up on my computer and show you what they said. If this is, if we had this money available, these are things we would need. Is this a chart right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If this is what we would like to use, and we think we could use this in our buildings to assist in instruction, if we had the option, if we had dollars available to purchase it. So we've asked some of those questions. I guess the question that you're asking specifically as an educator, because you, as an educator, you, learn, you know a lot, <laughs> is, you know, how do we salt the oats, so to speak? How do we get 
technology in and show what it can be done, what we can do with it in order to help others desire that technology and want to use it so that all students will have access. I think that's at least part of the question as I was hearing it. I think, that's I think the survey suggested that there is a, a quite the demand for it. But again, I as a toy. Well, <laughs> but as a yeah, tool, I'm right, I'm saying right. exactly. Um, I, I understand you know, what you're saying, yeah. but there's also, at least at this point, the expectation that they're used for meaningful learning yes. and that we're learning content and standards, yeah. and that has been our focus. <laughs> um, I think maybe are you talking about professional expectations of what they do with them? Um, student expectations of what they do with them. I mean, I think we can get to some of those, but our overriding principle has been we want students to learn in an engaged manner the content and standards that we expect. So that's what has been encouraging to me in terms of how we're using it. Well, I, That's a broad answer, but I, I do understand what you're saying. I, and I don't know where I read it, but it was um, somebody had a, what they called a digital citizen, citizenship curriculum mm -hmm. plan K-12, and it had that kind of stuff laid out in it. So we might want to. We have, we have some of our media specialists, uh, media uh, center specialists who are using that type of approach in their mm -hmm. classrooms. So. Common Sense Media, we do those, kind of, media, lessons. We do those right. kind of lessons, so when I go in, I'm going to do a digital piece with students, specifically um, in the intermediate building, I was asked to come in and target digital citizenship because of that age level and the, the device that was in hand and the type of activity that we were doing. So I went in and I used that Common Sense Media and we talked about what the digi digital citizenship was going to look like with that um, activity. and. We practiced it and you know we ha I had to go back and I had to do the lesson a couple times because that's a learning curve and that's a learning curve as a teacher um, stepping out of my role going back into my role if I'm as just a regular teacher if I'm going to have that device I have to be the one that implements that those type of digital skills within they have mm -hmm. to become embedded within my curriculum because of that that tool is not a tool it is my curriculum um, and so those kind of things we are hopefully modeling, but will the students, the teachers will take on and start having that as, you know, their curriculum when they, when we hand out the device, these are, you know, this is what you're going to do, and just like a textbook, you don't throw your textbook, you don't put your water on top of your textbook, you do those same type of activities, it's just now with a digital piece. I, I understand, and we, we purposefully met with the language arts teachers and walked through right. two, two times you know Feels what like was going to be there how we were going to manage these in the classroom but also our expectations to use them and to uh, use them in in a uh, way where students were not um, going where they shouldn't go all i mean we had um, two times we've met so yes I, I understand what you're saying but when students probably don't have access a lot you know the it's not going to make any meaning for them unless they're using them all the time. So, um, but I, I do think that we understand that, but in probably a more unified manner need to, to right. put some things. As well, I, I think as a teacher, you know, if I were teaching, I would want to know what, what are the expectations here? Mm -hmm. So are there any expectations? Do I have to do anything with, um, with technology or can I just opt out opt out right and so exactly. yeah. so when I talk about expectations mm -hmm. that's that's you know it's it's setting the bar mm -hmm. and um, so and Suzanne. I understand that and what you're I think what you're trying to get to I'm with you on that because you have to have an overarching goal and you, and you have to have a t target to get to in order to set priorities. So in order to win limiting funds, you know where you want to get to, so you have to <coughs> set priorities. My concern uh, about setting expectations too specifically is, I, I mean, I kind of like the, um, the idea of engaged <coughs> learning, 
we already know what a student is supposed to learn in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. We know that. So I kind of like that goal, but the issue becomes if you are too specific with teachers, well, in unit one, we want you to do this with the computer. Oh, yeah. You can't do that. No. So you have to provide the tools and make sure they know how to use them, and then I think you kind of have to let them decide, right? I mean, you have to say, we expect you to use it, and here's a bunch of ways you can, and, and we want you to know how to use it. But I don't, I don't think we want to get to the point where we're, um, you know, prescribing it too much. But at the same time, if you don't have a plan with priorities on it, as far as um, we want to this uh, access, all access, digital, I can't remember what the phrase daily is, daily, 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 digital daily digital access versus one to one. Right. Um, to me, that sounds like, okay, the priority obviously is to make sure there's enough devices so that when teachers want to use them in their classroom, they can. But then it seems like maybe the other part of that is making sure that, and I know we're not really at bring your own, but at the same time, does that mean maybe we need to concentrate on making sure that that stuff is available so that they can get to it, so that they're if they're in the lab, that it's it almost sounds like infrastructure might be a higher priority. Well, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's some like, questions here I think that we have to actually get down to the principal level. The principal is the leader in the building, and the principals are observing how teachers are teaching. And uh, they, uh, they are obviously seeing areas when teachers are ready. They're seeing areas probably where with some assistance, and I'm sure our coaches have done this, uh, been there to uh, nudge teachers a bit. They were ready, but they were reticent. And I think what we, at least when you look now at what the elementary teachers are asking for, I mean, excuse me, elementary principals, they are saying that we see additional opportunities here where teachers are ready, and if we could have them there, that they would be using them to deliver the curriculum more effectively, perhaps. I think we have enough. We could, we could verify that with at least what the principals have said to us. Okay. But I think from the standpoint of how do we monitor and how do we ensure that that teachers are not just opting out mm -hmm. and not doing that. That has to be, I believe, the building that's leadership your, your super that leader, takes the sure. responsibility of that part of it. I think there, there's evolutionary spikes too. Maybe eight, ten years ago, the expectation was you're going to you're going to send email. We're going to communicate a lot by email with your building principal, with your peers. You're going to learn we're processing. You're going to do your grades online. These were the expectations that really the building administrator kind of. Uh, you know, had those expectations. The district had it as well. Um, we then had another uh, place where, because we didn't have devices in every room, and we still don't, but we have projectors, we have smart boards. There's an expectation that those are used for different kind of curriculum activities. Uh, some of the Pearson product, and that was that's a direct, uh, almost not order, but that's what is expected from that curriculum is to is to use those uh, devices up there. Uh, so I think we're in that phase now where. Um, we can go to the next level. How are you going to use these as, as real curriculum tools? And, and we, we, we see it being done in a percentage of our classrooms, but it's also because they've had access to those devices for a longer period of time. We had Mrs. Phillips, who's one of our guinea pigs in, the, in you know, second, third, fourth grade, to, to use those devices. She had them every day, and so she had a different style that she could use than maybe the one down the hallway who didn't have any tools or maybe shared it once every two or three weeks so there's a different expectation for that person that has it every day and and then that person also that teacher also uh, wants to rise to that challenge she wants to use it in a different way she, she um, you know you heard Clayton Smith hey it is in three days it has changed the way I deliver my curriculum the way I, I interact with my students I'm no longer a, a lecturer I am with that student I'm a, I'm a proctor you know I'm a mentor with that person and so forth so I, it's kind of a chicken and egg, you know, we can prescribe it, but if they're not ready, then they're going to say, I can't even get to that point of, of that expectation because I don't have that. But I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think we're in that, that point where we can set those new standards. But I think uh, what I think the needed, board so. is really needing, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, I think what we're needing, though, is I love that it's driven more by curriculum than we just want a device in front of every kid. Right. Curriculum needs should be driving this. I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. But what I think we need to see is what are your priorities? And then, of course, dollars need to be assigned to them. And then if there's a plan in place, then you can say, okay, here's, a, here's the dollars that we have in the budget, and here's how we're going to use them. But here's the next high priority is this. 
is there any chance there's some grant dollars to help us with that? Or is there, or when we start talking about bond issues, is there, but if we don't see that plan, again, driven by curriculum, I, I like that. I think that's smarter. But there has to be some sort of order, and it's, it's not going to be as clean as we'd like it, especially those of us that are linear thinkers on the board. But, um, but I think we need to see some sort of an idea of, okay, what do you see as your priorities? Where, and you're, you're pointing us at the holes, and I, I appreciate that. But um, in what order do we wish to fulfill these needs, um, given a small pool of money today, um, and then, okay, how high of a priority is this? Do we need to go f figure out uh, leasing? Um, you know, how far? Well, I appreciate that because we we have uh, those discussions as well. So, also to, to kind of piggyback on that and to give, I'll just give a specific example. Um, our third graders take um, that that's when they began to take the assessment online is that correct yes correct okay so um, I'm in a building where my maybe perhaps my second graders have and maybe my third graders have really been exposed to to the computers mm -hmm. and they know how to use them pretty well but maybe somebody else is in a building where their, their second graders or third graders haven't gotten to use the computers hardly any at all. So to me, they're at a real disadvantage when they go to take this assessment and they're doing it for the first time online. So when I talk about a plan, I'm not talking about necessarily really specifics, but if we know that this is what we're going to be dealing with then we need to ensure that those students I don't care whether we decide they need 15 hours on the computer or whatever but obviously they need practice mm -hmm. using that those computers and so I just feel like it's kind of like it's kind of like well if you're in a building where you can get an iPad cart then you're going to get to practice but if you're not then and so when I talk about a, a plan that's kind of what I, you know that's part of it that's not the whole thing but that's certainly part of it. Kathy can you tell us about the assessment part of that? Yeah. Um, I don't know that myself. Yes actually we knew coming into this year that there were going to be the technology enhanced items on the assessments and so um, we brought in SchoolNet and um, you know we talk about doing too much testing but the one of the main purposes for bringing that in and doing the benchmark assessments was to give our students time in the labs on those computers because those are the testing devices that we use for ISAP giving them practice in the labs on those computers using those actually engaging in those technology enhanced items and so all of our students from grades three through eight have had multiple opportunities to practice the assessment piece of it. Now that, that doesn't take away from the daily practice or whatever practice they would have in the classroom on the iPads, but it's a different device, a different setting. And so um, that piece, the assessment piece, shouldn't be impacted by the plan or a lack of a plan, because we did have a plan for ensuring that all students had Good. access to those. <coughs> Thank you. I thought we were mm -hmm. done. I'd like to go back to the funding question. I'd like to remind us of some things, and then I also have a question. Um, by the mere fact that we did the, the severance and the retirement bond years ago, squeezed our capital projects. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we went to our taxpayers and said, hey, we're going to eliminate um, a debt that we needed to. Mm -hmm. Smartest thing the board probably ever did. but." Part of that agreement was we're not going to raise the taxes as a result of that. Well, so as I take a look at the amount of money that we've lost in capital projects, and it probably had a direct correlation to the amount of funds back in 2006 when you showed the decrease in expense, we made a conscious decision at that point that we're going to forego these areas 
um, to eliminate our debt. So we've done that. We're, we're in the process of doing that, and then that comes off in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we will pick up money again in 2019 for our capital projects, which in my opinion should really be the main funder of this. Um, so I, with that said, I'm a little hesitant about borrowing money because let's go back to past history. I can believe, I believe in 2004, 2002, 2004, 2006, we did $2 million bonds for five years in a row, tech bonds. To yeah, get us it started in, in 1999. It was about yeah, a to get into buying process. computers and right. all of that. It was an add-on. That was an add-on. It was an add-on. Right. Not built in, not sustained, not anything. So then in 2008, all of a sudden we've got 2,000 computers that we've got to replace. So then we borrow more money. Or use rainy day well, money. Use some rainy day to mm -hmm. and, and then go through dealing with every year for, I think, five years of leasing or buying or spending 350000 is the number that's in my head. Yeah, for that total uh, sustainability of the switches. So, and the pieces, again, so, right. that so was an add-on. On no, that was just CPF, yeah. But again, was an add-on. No. <coughs> well, it, an add-on expense. It, it, I really didn't see anything that would sustain. That no, we just, we just said from our 700000 each right. year, we're going to commit this much. That way, <coughs> uh, we'd be in better position than what maybe happened in that 10-year time frame. So, my... Before, yeah. Going to my point is when I see a proposal to spend $2 million to buy de devices, again, I see this as an add-on. I guess my question is, if this is such a high priority, are you telling me that we can't repurpose, repurpose funds to support this? Every other expense that we have in our system is equally as important or higher that we can't repurchase the funds to start a technology plan to, to buy? I think absolutely you could do that, but other things will be lost. Well, right. I mean, it's a choice. But that's, but that's not a discussion that we've had. We've not, not talked about not right. how we evaluated all of our program. Where, you know, let's talk about where the money is. If this is so important, then this needs to be repurposed money in our plan every year, and we're not talking about how we're going to fund it or how we're going to bond it every year. And, and I think that that's, that's a conversation that we will have when the time is right because it's an option. Um, all, at this point, we're talking options. And um, one thing that I hesitate on the, the 2019 date is that our CPF has, has really been hurt for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have buildings that are going to need work. And we are going to take back about 1.1 a year, which doesn't go very far when you have 14 buildings, 16 buildings to maintain, utilities continue to go up, and, and all of those things that go with this and we need technology, all of it's there. So I am a little hesitant to say that we'll have to do it out of CPF when I know we are doing what we have to do <coughs> in CPF and not what we need or maybe even want to do would be the key. Um, so I completely agree with, with the thought that we can do it with what we've got if we make the choices. But I am really nervous to say that we can count on 2019 because at that point we're already looking four or five years ahead and we haven't purchased anything new. Um, so that's just something as we look and give you options, it is a consideration that we'll go through. And we can go through program by program um, and, and look at dollars and say, do we want to commit to this? But it will be hard decisions that we have to make when we go to that. Our budget is 97% salaries and benefits. Yep. There is not a lot of fluff in our budget, and it's going to be really tough decisions if we decide that that's the route that we're going to take. Um, so it's just something we'll definitely look at. You're but, talking about the general fund, 97%, not the capital projects. Right, capital projects. Right. I mean, we have a two point well, three but the, million. That was the whole point why I brought year. it up is because we, I wanted to, to remind everybody that we created that ourselves. We had that, 
we knew it was going to be tight in capital yeah. projects. Now I'm not standing was here still advocating. Right decision. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying that in 2019 that we're going to have all of those funds available. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, I would rather see a plan with something that has this magnitude of importance, from what I'm hearing, that is repurposed and sustained. And then you're coming to me wanting to, to bond something that we want instead of something that we need. And I, I just, I kind of saw this as, this is sort of the survey as to <coughs> if money wasn't an issue today and we wanted to get as the number of devices we, we would like to have, this is what it would yeah. cost. Because now you know, the we're going to have to fight the, the, the money thing. issue yeah. from here on out. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the, the government's going to make sure that right. we don't have extra money. And then when we get a little bit of extra money, they'll probably give it to the charter schools too. Right. But the point is, I really would want to get away from, we need this, let's go borrow money. That's... No. To me, it's not important if that's how we're going to fund it. The plan is the thing, and the plan has to include the right. sustainability and the repair and the oh, sure, and right. the lifespan and all of those things. And I think, Jeff, at least what we were saying, if I was understanding mm -hmm. correctly with what we were bringing tonight, we were saying this, um, you know, this is what it looks like right now. Uh, this is what we have, but we're certainly not recommending at this point Right. that we go borrow money to do it at all. What we really are saying is that next year we'll have about $140,000 that we can use and then add maybe some more as a result of the project at Hibbert. We can add to that. That's what we're saying. Uh, the, so I, I don't think we were trying to come with a recommendation at all to go beyond. So as far as a long-range improvement plan, I, we didn't intend this to be. We were just trying tonight to say... Uh, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to do. This is where we are instructionally. And that's why we had, you know, ask our instructional people to be here. This is where, where we are instructionally. Now, given where we are instructionally now and where we see people wanting to use the technology, they're wanting to use it uh, for additional curriculum support, and it would cost additional dollars. And so it would be difficult probably, or at least we're saying, for us to keep up with the demand. But we weren't really intending to come with any particular recommendation. I think, too, when we looked back at our plan as it would, was put together in the, the book, uh, part of the you know discussion probably at that time was maybe to design a plan and then think about how we would fund it. But I think, as at least in my ad admonition to the group here, was not to come and propose something that at present we weren't prepared to fund. Now, when you talk about repurposing dollars, uh, Again, I'm, I don't have the understanding of the capital projects and knowing all the things that need to be done there, but the repurposing would have to come, I think, from the general fund. Would it not? So, I mean, I'm not well, saying we couldn't use, I don't know where else their dollars would be, but, uh, you know, there might be ways, uh, and there are ways, if we're willing to, uh, you know, with, you know not use some general fund dollars differently, that maybe there could be some added. Uh, but we would, we would certainly need to use them differently we've been, than we've been using them in the past. And we're in the process also of doing that, looking at ways that we're using dollars and maybe we'll need to use them differently in the past. So we're, we're on that right now. But knowing, uh, I guess, what, uh, what we're not sure about is in looking at ways to use dollars differently and getting ahead in the general funds, uh, we're not sure, again, what may happen with the budget and how long those dollars will sustain us. You know, so for that reason, I guess I would be happy to talk about what we might do in uh, technology with, the, with our general fund at the moment, anyway. Uh, we'll, we'll have a better handle next year, probably, than we do now on that part of it. Well, and, and I did want to say, oh, I want to thank all of you again. I know you've done a tremendous amount of hard work and preparation for what you've done tonight. Um, and you just have to understand that right now we're facing so many tough decisions on money <laughs> that we're looking at 
every little angle of where, where can we save, what can we do, so that we can keep producing the kinds of kids that we saw mm -hmm. at the podium tonight. And, and I know we all want that, but I do know that um, um, along with the decisions that we have to make, that you guys are having to work exceedingly hard, digging deep and, and finding information so that Appreciate we can that, make yeah. the decisions. You know, we're going to, our schools are, are going to educate kids whether we have these things or not. We're going to educate whether we took $8 million out to renovate buildings, Crestdale, Dennis, and so forth. Mm -hmm. We're still going to educate them at, at a top notch. So I think it's just looking where that most of the impact you can make for a student is necessary. And so we wanted to, to put a scorecard together. We wanted to put out a prediction here, say this is what we have. Uh, we're not making a recommendation, uh, Mr. Slifer. I'd love to say, hey, let's do let's do something to, to get to that let's point. Let's write the so check. Let's cool. write the check. We know we we're not at that point. We you know we haven't discussed that much, but that gives you an idea of what could how we yes. could impact every classroom to get that digital that daily digital device out there uh, for for the students for for what we think is the, the best thing is for them to, to to go forward and to prepare them as they go on you know to their careers or, or college and so forth. So. Well, we've got teachers there that are still standing on their feet after a very long day answering tough questions. So, thank you. Anything else? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a feeling it won't be our last discussion mm -hmm. about <laughs> technology. Never is. No. That'd be great. Oh, that was a good <laughs> Yes, well, it was a work session, so um, yes. wouldn't be a work session if we didn't work. Ask questions. Didn't work. <laughs> Ask questions and. <coughs> <coughs> okay, we are now ready for our next, our second public commentary. Anyone from the public wishing to speak? No, not too many. Kelly, do you want to speak? Okay, come forth. Um, really, the only comment that I would have is, I think that, well, first of all, to say thank you, because I know they, that, that the team put together quite a presentation. Um, I just want to be sure that everyone understands that teachers are as excited about technology in, for, for the most part as their students are. Um, I think what is one of the factors that holds teachers back is it's so rapidly changing. You know, we heard we have school net now and it's gone tomorrow and we have this now and it's gone tomorrow and teachers are so busy and investing the time in something is not, in the technology, is not something teachers shy away from. Um, what I think our biggest problem is, is we just saw what our wish list looks like, and there just isn't enough of it to go around. So, um, and, and I, that's not the fault of anyone at this table. It's obviously a funding issue, and I think Mr. Slifer hit the nail on the head when he talked about it's a governmental issue. Um, and when that changes, I think we'll be in a much better position. Uh, hopefully it will change. But I just want to be sure that everyone is clear that, uh, you know, as a representative of the, te of the teachers, um, I think that survey spoke volumes when it said there, there is a lot of interest in bringing technology into the classroom. And a lot of teachers, I think, are ready for it. There just are not the resources for it right now. And so um, to invest in uh, the hope that that cart's going to be available or those laptops are going to be available, particularly when we're looking at an incredible amount of testing now that's reliant upon technology. So, you know, there are big chunks of time out of the school year where it's just not feasible for teachers to plan any kind of research or any kind of activity, uh, curricular activity using technology because there just isn't the availability. So um, I don't want anybody to believe that there isn't an interest out there and I don't think anyone was saying that, but I, you know, for folks that are watching at home, I want to be clear that, you know, we recognize um, that this is the direction that education is going because this is the direction the world's going and we want to make sure our students are fully capable of, um, of functioning in a highly technological world. So thank you for the opportunity though to say that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you said you. it well. Yes. 
Okay, we're ready for board reports, old business. Anything? I have Dixie. one report. Just I wanted everybody to know that the letters had, uh, thank you letters had been sent out to the university team, right. also to the deans of the universities for um, helping provide the university search team, and then all the other letters that were connected to the superintendent search. They've all been done and out. Thank you very much for taking care of that. We appreciate it. Anything else? Um, I will uh, remind us that tomorrow morning um, is radio time and um, Suzanne has um, graciously accepted that um, commitment. <laughs> And that spot on the radio um, the day after our board meetings. So I uh, appreciate that. If anyone um, just yearns to be on the radio, uh, I'm sure that Suzanne would re relinquish that spot. Um, it's her marketing job. <laughs> the other so, um, thought about that is if you, um, I had offered to sort of pull what I think is the because it is a very short segment it is the the main topic that they're going to want to talk about <laughs> or at least make the suggestion but if you have any of those suggestions please let me know because it really does go very quickly so it's good to have a, um, a set of notes and then I the last I've only done it twice this will be the second time but I'll, I send an email before the meetings over with uh, bullets okay to them so that we can make the absolute most of that seven minutes or whatever it is <laughs> so, okay. okay okay thanks yes do you have something you want to celebrate yes um i don't know if suzanne was going to do it uh, Go ahead. um celebrations to richmond high school basketball coach joe loose who was named indiana basketball coach of the year mm -hmm. of Go all uh, the coaches as well as uh, uh richmond senior joel okafor who mm -hmm was named to the Indiana All-Star. Mm -hmm. First, I think the first time we've had a male named to that in 15 years, so. Yay. To We're that. actually gonna host a, a boys and a girls exhibition of those teams mm -hmm. in June, I think, yeah. so that'll be fun. Actually, uh, we, we are very flexible here, and just as an example, uh, we thought earlier that we actually were going to have some students here, and we were going to be celebrating the athletic wins. <laughs> But we had all the others, so and I'm sure the athletes were doing something else tonight. So uh, it was when they arrived that I realized that that had changed. So, <laughs> but well, that was super fun. That was great. I loved that. But so, there's so much going on at the high school. So and they they can improvise. So that was that was good. Um, also, um, I didn't get to attend um, kindergarten rocks and oh my preschool goodness. rules it did. because <laughs> right. it did. I. Um, had a tooth pulled that day <laughs> but um anyway Did i you get understand. one of those little plastic tooths to put it in <laughs> well no they didn't darn it but i understand that it was just an awesome event and i wanted to um thank everyone who was involved in that organizing and um and it just sounds like it was awesome so um so thanks for uh, helping that to be a success again this year and I hope we got lots of preschoolers and kindergartners enrolled if not there's still time absolutely, right absolutely so get those little little gals and guys enrolled preschoolers and kindergartners um, <coughs> anything else for the good of the cause here before we go on to previewing our next meeting Okay. Well, you know, I'm not exactly sure what new we will have on our next meeting. We're trying to organize now so that we get on a schedule of work sessions and regular sessions. <laughs> um, and we've caught up on a number of things that we have planned in advance. You know, we went with the, the transition of the high school. We've been into the transportation. We've talked about technology. I'm sure there will be a lot of other things we'll talk about, too, summer school coming up, and <clears throat> those kinds of things. But... Um, we may just be able to kind of get organized and be on a regular schedule here soon. Yes, with work yes. sessions, we'd like to do that. Uh, by the way, um, Jeff, I wanted to ask 
is there a rescheduled um, finance? Yeah. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. Okay. So we'll we'll yeah. look for that. Yeah, we need to get that rescheduled. Okay. Um, press conference. Uh uh. Oh. <laughs> we didn't cover it all, evidently. Louise, come <laughs> forth. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed going to COPE, the COPE Center this morning. I couldn't go to every project that the high school students were involved in, but they were, uh, you know, they were having fun, but they, I talked to people at COPE afterwards and they said they, they, I don't think they actually have formal records, but they thought maybe it was the most volunteers they had ever had at a single time, and they were astonished at how much got done. I was there for about, about an hour and a half and went to see the kids who were supposed to be planting trees, and they were just standing around. I asked Josh Amix what was going on, and he said, we were moving too fast. They asked us <laughs> to stop for a while because they wanted to give all the groups a chance to plant trees. <laughs> so I think they got everything on their list <coughs> done, and they were very thrilled about it. I, I did want to ask uh, if you're able to say if the um, teacher resignation that was in the addendum to the to the consent items, if that uh, is related to the the uh, investigation about the playground incident, if you're able to say that or not. I don't. I don't think that we can do that, Lisa. Okay. I don't think we can do that. All right. Um, so um, that was my primary question. So. Thank you. Will, will more information be forthcoming? Do you know at this point, or? Well, I, I know there's, uh, but not immediately. We're you know we're still working with family and trying to help them understand the, the concerns that we have, and they still have concerns as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Okay, we are ready for the bell ringer. Well, the bell ringer, you've just taken my thunder a bit. Oh, no. Oh, I tell you, the most exciting thing that I think I have done as an after-school event in Richmond was Kindergarten Rocks. <laughs> I want to repeat it somehow. I'm coming back next year. <laughs> rocks. I, I just came away from that evening, and I had so much energy, I couldn't sleep during the night. Uh, the, the, uh, watching those families come in, and the little ones come in, and the excitement that they felt and just overjoyed and I was just thinking the whole night long now how do we how do we keep this going in first grade and second grade and third grade uh, because they were just so excited to start school and, and all dressed up and whatever so I made some friends that night and I'm going to have to find a way you're going to have to give me progress reports over the years <laughs> my friends from that evening it certainly made an impression because as I spoke with someone the other day or they came and they approached me they they went to that only with an expectation of doing a feeler out there because they were really not intending on having their child, you know, enroll next year. They left there with the thought that not only are they going to enroll their child, they're going to tell other relatives, you know, to do the same. Right now, they highly impressed. It was done well. People here work so hard, and everywhere people work well to get it done. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.